Commissioner Bennett? Here. Commissioner Anderson? Present. Commissioner Nanke? Here. Commissioner Dickey? Here. Commissioner Benjamin? Here. Commissioner Bennett? Here. Commissioner Lewis? Here. Commissioner Caravaya is absent. Chair McCoy? Here. Uh, please join and pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, Commissioner Lewis, do you have a motion for me for the consent calendar? I do. I um, move approval of the consent calendar with one exception, that is to pull 3.2A, um, and that's my recommendation. Second. Moved and seconded by Commissioner Lewis to uh, approve the consent calendar with the pull of 3.2A. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion passes. Um, I'm in, in a hurry here. Uh, under, under public comment, there was nobody here for public comment, so we can move along there. Um, we have no action items. We do have an information report. Um, Andy, do you have anything to discuss with that information report? It looks sort of like we got one every month, but is there anything of import that you would like to point out for us? If, if, uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, could I take a quick minute back and talk about the uh, transitional housing from Oregon Health Authority real quick? We're gonna, it's it's been pulled. pulled. Oh, it's pulled. I'm sorry. Pulled. Yeah. I, I have nothing to say in the okay. program report. I'm sorry. Now we're special orders of business. Commissioner Lewis, do you have a motion for me? Uh, yes, I move uh, staff recommendation on agenda item 3.2A. Second. Moved by Commissioner Lewis and uh, seconded by Commissioner Bednarz to uh, uh, approve the staff recommendation on 3.2A. Commissioner Lewis to the motion. Oh, yeah, uh, less of me and more of you, Andy. Now, now, um, now is the time to talk about it. And I, the reason I pulled it is I, uh, I think it's a great thing. We've talked about supporting the veterans, but um, haven't seen as much action as some would like. This seems to be something that's great for us. My only question was, um, it looks like this is just through June of next year. And I, one of the questions I had was, do you know if it's going to be extended like many federal programs or not, or are we just in the black until later? Uh, in the black until later, but we, we hope so that it would be extended. Um, I think that this is a little bit of money that's left over from the 1517 biennium. Um, and so that's why it's nine months. Uh, I think we in the OHA, uh, Oregon Health Authority, they're not going to represent that there's any more money uh, in, advance of, um, in advance of the legislature. But um, in talking with staff, it seems pretty clear that uh, a transitional housing program for veterans that are homeless and it might have uh, multiple needs of services, that nine months is not always going to be a long enough time for a lot of folks. And so I would think that we would have opportunities to continue at least for a period of time uh, to serve those veterans um, into the next uh, biennium. At least that's, uh, that's our hope. Yeah, and um, I also wanted to afford you the opportunity to talk about the program, but I do have one other question and that is, we, we have the issue here, and now we have this potential program. Does it take a mini bite, a major bite, a big bite, hardly at all bite out of the issue? Can you tell us that? Uh, well, it's, um, it's progress. <laughs> um, and uh, what, we're, what we're suggesting is a minimum of, to serve a minimum of 30 uh, homeless veterans. Uh, we think we can do more. Um, sometimes in cases like this, if you over, if you don't meet your minimums, then you might not get a second chance. So we're being a little bit conservative. Um, the uh, CAP agency, Community Action Agency, works with the veteran 
uh, VA just like we do every every week on our VASH, our VASH vouchers. And uh, we think we've got the right team uh, with the right competencies and uh, and we will, I think we'll be successful. Uh, but um, it is a, uh, a small um, help to the multiple needs of the veterans. Any other questions? Nope, hearing none. You have any other further comments, Andy? You want to talk about it? Uh, I do not, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Moving along, we have no unfinished business, no new business. Oh, we got to take action. Oh, we got to vote. There is that. Okay, we have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Lewis, seconded by Se uh, Commissioner Bednars, to um, uh, take the staff recommendation on item 3.2A. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Now moving right along. We have no unfinished business or new business, so this meeting is adjourned. Good evening, everyone. I'm calling to order this evening's meeting of the Urban Renewal Agency for the City of Salem for May 9, 2016. Would the recorder please call the roll? Board Member Bennett? Here. Board Member Anderson? I'm here, too. Board Member Nanke? Here. Board Member McCoy? Here. Board Member Dickey? Here. Board Member Benjamin? Here. Board Member Bernards? Here. Board Member Lewis? Here. Chair Peterson? Here. Thank you. We now need approval of additions and deletions. Do we have any additions or deletions for the Urban Renewal Agency? None, all right. Well, we'll whiz right past that. No reports from boards, commissions, or committees. It's time for public comment. Is, has anyone signed up for public comment? No, well, we're just breezing right along, all right. The consent calendar. Member McCoy, do you have a motion for us, please? I do. I move approval of the consent calendar. It's been moved by, by Member McCoy and seconded by Member Nanke. Is there discussion? Member McCoy? No, it's uh, just the minutes, so there's not a lot to discuss here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. There are information reports in your binder. Actually, there's one, and that's the purchases approved administratively. Were there any questions on the report? Councillor Dickey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I actually have a question that's not related to this, but I don't know if when there is appropriate time to ask All right. the question. Yes. So um, here's a question about, um, I'd like to, I have a question about parking at the Pringle Parkade. Um, I, I had emailed you um, earlier this week. I had a situation where um, I had to go down there and I had an appointment at one of the businesses down there and I drove around the block for 15 minutes and couldn't find a parking spot. There was lots of available parking in the parkade, but I didn't have change for the parking meter. Um, and so I was just kind of curious to know what are we doing for parking in there? I know we're changing out some of our existing meters. Not, I'm not talking about adding new meters, but um, is there a plan to do anything with the parking in that structure? That's a good question. I think we have an answer coming. Kristen Rutherford, Urban Development Director. The parking meters that are in the Pringle Parkade have not been studied in the past for replacement with the new technology meters. We would be very happy at Council's direction to do that research and put together cost estimates for what it would cost to change out the coin-operated meters with new technology. Yes. yes, go ahead. So as a follow-up, and, and I guess, I mean, I'd love to see a report like that, but um, as a follow-up, is that something, is that, well, no, I'll, I'll wait and I'll ask later, thanks. <laughs> All right, I, oh, yeah, I'll ask later, thanks. <laughs> and we can't fix your parking You can't, I didn't get a ticket, I didn't get a ticket. <laughs> yes, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, on the question of whether they've been studied, I, I would just suggest that we maybe take a look back at, at what has gone on regarding parking meter technology and the replacement. And I think that our, I think the expectation of the committee, the mayor's committee on this was that uh, we were going to look at all parking technology for replacement ultimately. We, 
we actually have had, uh, I think for those of us who were involved in wanting to get that changeover, we're moving a little slower than we expected. So maybe this is one of those, if you need some authorization, if you could just uh, put this onto our agenda to give you the authorization you need, I think we probably thought you had it. So mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think we yeah. want to get rid of these coin operated because yes. Diana is not the only person who wanders Salem streets looking for a moment to stop, grab some change, and oh, certainly, to park. Oh, excuse me. Right. Certainly, if it's the sense uh, of the agency board, we, we can we can initiate that that review uh, without direct action by the agency board. I, I, yeah, I, I, I yeah. maybe this is phase C. We've been waiting on phase A, phase B. Let's just call this phase C and see how fast we can get her done. Yeah. I I share Councillor Bennett's uh, memory on this. I I don't ever remember the Pringle Parkade being exempt from the plan to replace the old technology with new technology. So I'm rather surprised that it w isn't already in the plan. It certainly was well studied when we had the year-long parking task force. Certainly those figures were included. And uh, there, there was never any area that was excluded from transitioning to the new technology. Okay, great. We can move forward immediately with getting cost estimates for the swap at the Pringle Park Cape. Yeah. All right. Member, member um, Benjamin, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, maybe just a note of caution from what I heard from Count or, uh, Dickie here is that it, there was hardly anybody in there, didn't have any change, but the rest of the block was packed. So instead of doing all the meters, Look what that costs, and then maybe just have one floor of the new technology and phase it in. Okay, thank you. All right, any further discussion on the motion? Or is that a motion, Councillor Dickey? Did you make a motion I, regarding that? I didn't, that? but I would be glad to. It sounded like okay. we don't need a motion for this. We don't. Right. All right, well, then good. Thank you. But thank you for bringing that up. All right. We have no special orders of business and no public hearing, and I see no new business. So this meeting of the Urban Renewal Agency is adjourned. It's now time to call to order the Salem City Council meeting for Monday, May 9th, 2016. Would the recorder please call the roll? Councilor Bennett? Here. Councilor Anderson? Present. Councilor Nanke? Here. Councilor McCoy? Here. Councilor Dickey? Here. Councilor Benjamin? Here. Councilor Bernards? Here. Councilor Lewis? Here. Mayor Peterson? Here. Thank you. Now I know that we do have additions to the agenda. Councilor McCoy, do you have a motion for us? Yes, Madam Mayor. I move approvals of additions and deletions to the agenda. Second. It's been moved by Councilor McCoy and seconded by Councilor Bednars to move the council agenda. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. And I apologize, Councillor McCoy, I denied you the time to tell us what's on the consent calendar. Are you ready for that? Those 30 pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Additions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, we've got two additions. Uh, we have three. Proclamation for Janet Noakes Day. Uh, we have um, addition of a public hearing, the adoption of the 2016-17 Housing and Community Develop Annual Action Plan, and a mayor's item rescheduling of some council meetings um, to uh, deal with uh, vacation schedules and, and make sure we have as many counselors as we can at the meetings. Thank you. All right. And the motion did pass, so we will now move on to proclamations, and we have three proclamations this evening. So I'm going to start. <coughs> We're going to start with council comment first, <laughs> and city manager comment, sorry. See, I'm just so excited about these proclamations. We have a lot of guests tonight for proclamations. All right, councilor comment, councilor Anderson, and then councilor McCoy. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the city, I attended, um, 
Last week, the Oregon Heritage Conference, the ad advocacy session, which was at the uh, State Capitol Hearings Room E, last uh, Wednesday morning, and um, I welcomed them on behalf of the city and discussed uh, what the city has done to earn its Oregon Heritage All-Star City Award, and I also discussed what more we could do. Uh, it was followed by a very informative program of uh, s uh, excellent speakers on the local level, on the state level, on the national level as to what uh, we can do to preserve our Oregon heritage. And I think it was a wonderful program and I was glad to be there on behalf of the city. And thank you for attending that. Uh, it was a large help because our schedules were getting very full, but it was important that the city be I'm represented. Happy to help you out thank you. I appreciate that. And let's see, Councillor McCoy and then Councillor Bentnars. Well, you know, that Heritage Commission was in town for several days, so I too re represented the city on behalf of the mayor um, at their awards banquet at last Thursday, which, which is at Reed Opera House, which was appropriate for the Heritage Commission banquet, I thought. Um, and it was a big crowd. There must have been uh, almost 200 people in the room and great awards with a, a lot of different people winning things. It's pretty interesting, the awards they give out, but I like awards programs. So had a good time, uh, talked a little bit about the history, some of our past award winners, some things they could see while they were still in town and urged them to frequent our downtown uh, restaurants and uh, have a good time. And it was also you know, a taco crawl. So I said, if you don't have enough to eat, <laughs> jump right in there. There's a taco crawl going on downtown. I also, on behalf of the mayor, and this, this was a several weeks ago, um, represented the city uh, at the new police, uh, state police headquarters as they um, basically uh, christened, I guess, Burrite Lane, ma named after uh, uh, a state trooper that was injured in, in an accident uh, years ago and was there. It was pretty impressive, had a lot of troopers out in full, full gear. Um, the family was there. It's a really good, e a really a nice event and uh, well deserved. Also, got to tour um, the new state, state police facility, and uh, it was interesting. And things we could consider as we look at the police facility is 88,000 square feet um, in one building. It's on two stories. Um, it had a big lot there with 450 parking spaces in the back and a big uh, uh, facility to uh, maintain the cars. It was tilt up. Uh, it was interesting the way they approached it. Um, they had con you know, polished concrete floors. They weren't, uh, weren't going all out. Um, uh, and an interesting thing, I thought it really made the building look really neat, but they had uh, sort of an industrial look to it where you could see the, you know, the conditioning, the, you know, the pipes and all the vents and all that stuff up above it. Um, which uh, uh, was it made a, it was a unique building. It was really well done, um, much different than what we're talking about with the police facility in terms of design because they didn't have the rectangular design. We've our folks have said is the most efficient use of the building. It it was uh, a little bit here and there, but they've got four or five other uh, agencies in there with them: the fire marshal and I forget the other ones. But it's not more than just the state police. But a very impressive facility. Um, you know, the, the contractor was there taking me around and uh, saying, there's some things we can do, we think, uh, so talk to us before you go on <laughs> building to save us some money. Great. Thank you. All right, Councillor Bednars. I had two things I wanted to cover. First off was uh, we had a meeting last Monday afternoon of the Homeless Task Force out in Kaiser um, uh, City Hall. And I can say, you know, I, I'm worried that we're, we're not going to get anywhere. It's going to be a discussion. But I'm really starting to see, this is, a, by the way, I want a committee that, that our own mayor co-chairs with the mayor of Kaiser and two county commissioners as well. Um, anyway, that, that we are starting to break the issue down into bite-sized pieces where we can take a look at housing or wraparound services or whatever else that we need to have. So we've, we've assigned people to di different tasks within the... Um, within that task force. And I also mentioned that next uh, Monday, the 16th at 4.30, we'll be meeting, meeting once again. It'll be this time over at the uh, courthouse um, on uh, Chemeketa Street. 
um, not the courthouse itself, but this, I think it's the senator room in the, in the, the right, county's Right, courthouse square. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, the, the other one I wanted to talk about was, and this is real short, but this Wednesday night is our final budget, as far as I know, final budget meeting. It's the one where we go through our wish list. The, the, uh, in fact, there is not much else on the budget, uh, on that agenda, but for us to discuss those wish list items and how, what we're gonna do to pass those on to the city council. And remember, there's 18 people on the budget committee, but it's a time that people who want to advocate for items to be included in the budget should show up and just reminding people to show up next uh, this coming Wednesday night at 6 p.m. in this very room. Thank you very much. Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On Friday evening, I had a chance to represent the city at the North Salem High School uh, Wood Manufacturing <laughs> Awards Ceremony, which was put on by students uh, involved in uh, the woodworking program at North Salem High School. Uh, it was one of those really inspiring evenings where you uh, had a chance to see some incredibly creative students led by inspiring teachers doing some pretty amazing stuff. And mm. uh, uh, the woodworking alone was worth the, the time. The barbecue was great. Uh, but I, I think more than anything was finding out uh, how advanced the career and technical education program is at North Salem High School particularly as it relates to um, uh, woodworking and cabinetry and uh, really highly skilled jobs that are, are uh, really being created. There were, must have been almost two dozen students graduating from the program. Uh, it's led by a nationally recognized uh, uh, woodworking artist uh, really from Montana who's been hired by North Salem High School. He, he owns the Chidwick School of Woodworking in, uh, uh, in Montana and also operate, uh, is now the leader of uh, North Salem High School's program. Uh, this is just a really fantastic program using one of our local natural resources in an incredibly creative way. I, I really recommend if you ever get a chance to go over and see this program, go over and take a look. It's wonderful. I'm glad that you were able to attend that certainly is um, refreshing to see all of the different technical programs that are coming forward now in Salem-Kaiser schools and at the SeaTech uh, yep. over on North Portland Road. So it seems to be a time for innovation in education and I'm glad Salem is really on the forefront yeah. with that. Councillor Anderson. Thank you. I have a, a follow-up question either for you, Madam Mayor, or Councillor Bednarz. Uh, I got the notice of the committee meeting on the 16th, but I wasn't aware, was it, is the committee as a whole or is it a subcommittee? If it's a subcommittee, what are they about? So the subcommittee is gonna be about housing specific okay. as a okay. group, and then that's at four o'clock and at 4.30, mm -hmm. it will be uh, the general group okay. itself. And Thanks. they've been very well attended. Uh, yes. I'm really proud of the yeah. community. Thank you. Good. Yeah, thanks for asking uh, for clarification on that. It was a little confusing when the message came out. I, I shared the confusion and I'm the co-chair, so there we are. But I'm glad we're getting it uh, clarified tonight. There will be many meetings over the course of time and we'll try hard to be sure that the notice gets out to everyone. And of course, all the meetings are open meetings. We'll be following all of the Oregon open meeting laws by noticing them and by being certain that uh, the public is welcome to them. They'll all be recorded so that uh, people can listen to the recordings or get copies of the minutes afterwards as well. Councillor McCoy. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, looking at this, all this, these handouts on the table got me thinking. I uh, had my car in at the Ford dealership here uh, for uh, some maintenance and, and, and working, and I said, well, it'll be a good time for me to have my morning walk, so I walked home. Um, to the South Hills in South Salem. It took me about an hour walking up commercial and up Sunnyside. And I can't tell you how many times drivers didn't, they just ignore it. They don't even see you. And I'm cro crossing Kubler, hit the light, and look to the left because I got all these people waiting for a free right turn and they're whizzing right by me. And, and, and finally I had to take a step out to get them to stop just to get across the street. Get two thirds of the way across the street and a lady comes screaming up, it scared me. I stopped because she must've been going 30 miles an hour, jammed her brakes, came all the way through the crosswalk in front of me. I had to walk around the front of her to, to get, get to the other side of the street. That was in a 20 second 
uh, deal. And uh, it was that way, <laughs> it was sort of that way all the way up, up commercial as I walked it. I got uh, slower and more cautious at every street corner as I went up the street because my, I figured out pretty quickly, I, even in, um, in, I had a bright orange shirt on this morning, <laughs> Mm -hmm. They weren't seeing me. Yeah, so, you know, you, this stuff is, is serious. I don't know how we get to it, but, you know, you can say, well, the pedestrians, but these drivers were just, you weren't there. And they were speeding, cutting by, turning in front of you, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So, you know, this might be a good moment if I could ask our city manager. I know that the city manager and the police chief and others in the traffic department. Uh, Public Works have been looking at the issue. Could you please just give us a little recap? I know that there's a plan to have uh, a lot of what we're doing now evaluated to see what we might do differently or in addition. Well, the, the police chief may speak to that uh, under the discussion of the proclamation. Uh, Public Works Director Fernandez could perhaps speak to the, the evaluation that we're currently planning to conduct. I know Peter. Certainly, Peter Fernandez, Public Works Director. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we take this uh, this issue of, of pedestrian safety seriously, and uh, the the tragedies that we've had recently. We are looking to bring in an expert to uh, review the accidents that we've had to see if there's something we're not seeing. Uh, is there a uh, is is there something else that uh, that could be done to then address the issues? A look at our toolbox. Uh, to see, you know, are there other tools that we should be implementing beyond what we're doing? So we're working on that. Uh, we plan on uh, uh, when we have that uh, that individual, that firm hired. We plan on having some public meetings. Uh, see beyond that if there's education issues. But uh, but what Councillor McCoy describes is 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 every day for the for the pedestrian and for bicyclists. Uh, in the city, and, and, and especially Councillor McCoy, as you move uh, further south or further west where pedestrians are not anticipated, I think it's just drivers just don't see them. They're not anticipating them. And I don't think anybody's trying to be mean. I don't think anybody's trying to kill anybody. They just, you're invisible. So, <laughs> great experience for you. <laughs> the one that really got me, though, was the right turn. I stopped and one went through, and I started again, one went through. The third one looked right at me and started through. Yep. <laughs> I mean, yep. Clearly saw me. And she was, was trying to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that information, uh, uh, Mr. Fernandez. And I, and I will add that that uh, the city is doing its evaluation and process. And I've tar already met with uh, Councillor Anderson and asked him at the point that we're ready for uh, some community education programs and the community meetings, I've asked him to sort of take lead on that because he's been an advocate from the very first death that occurred that we stop and we pay attention to this and we come up with some new plans. So Councillor Anderson will be the person kind of assembling the community and I appreciate you being willing to, to take that on. Councillor Dickey. Thank you. Um, and on that note, I'm really happy to see we're also kind of diversifying how we're looking at this. So it's not just, you know, I mean, I'm really happy Public Works is involved and there's some other um, that other departments are involved. So it's a, a collaborative effort. But um, one of the things that kind of strikes me is that, you know, we've had a number of pedestrian deaths um, and yet when an expert takes a look at that, what Councillor McCoy described might not rise to the top in that, but that's what residents in Salem experience every single day. So hopefully some of those, we can bring some of those things to light. We have the, the issues that we can study because they've happened, but you know, there's a lot of near misses that don't happen and we'd like to prevent those as well. So if there's a way to somehow tease those out, that would be fantastic. I think that's an excellent point. Excellent point. Good. All right. Further councilor comment? <coughs> City manager comment. Yes, thank you. I want to take this opportunity to, to remind counselors and to encourage counselors and those who are watching to really uh, take advantage of the communication tools that the city is producing. I, I, I read the May issue of the Community Connections and it's just full of, of very good information, information on our street and, bo uh, street and bridges uh, bond, uh, preparedness for emergencies. Uh, traffic safety. So I would, I would really encourage you to, to have your constituents subscribe to that Community Connection uh, newsletter. And second, uh, 
this month's issue of the League's magazine has some very good information on statewide issues that are of, of particular interest to Salem as, as, as we work through the challenges of the uh, fiscal year 16-17 budget. So I would encourage you uh, to take a few minutes at least to, to review uh, uh, the magazine and, and we, uh, we have our own local uh, expert on, on council. So if you have some follow-up, uh, President Nanke I'm sure would help us uh, make that uh, communication with, with the league, league staff and the league board. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Are there any further counselor comments? We will move now to proclamations. And I would uh, request the first group to come forward is the group that will help uh, to receive the Traffic Safety Week proclamation. And I believe Chief Moore has um, assigned Lieutenant Bales and officers DeMarco and Kofoid, am I saying that correctly? Well, there you go. You just take my conducts around with you. It doesn't hurt if you have a police officer doing this. Well, you're coming to this here, please. All right, I really am very, very honored to have this time with our law enforcement members of the city represented, and I know you represent all of the rest, and a very timely topic it is, Traffic Safety Week. And these gentlemen are going to help me in various ways to describe ways that we can be uh, more conscious when we are out walking and driving and bicycling and skateboarding, and I believe we have also a video that's going to assist us with this, is that right? No, I'm being told no. All right, here we go. Whereas the protection of Salem pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists is fundamentally important to the safety of our community. Whereas motorists and bicyclists are required by Oregon law to yield the right of way to pedestrians crossing streets in marked and unmarked crosswalks and are reminded when at a crosswalk they must stop for pedestrians and wait until a pedestrian clears the lane in which the vehicle is traveling or turning plus the next lane before proceeding. Whereas pedestrians are encouraged to be crosswalk smart cross at designated crosswalks or intersections, stop and look left and right and left again before crossing and watch for traffic as they cross the street. And whereas motorists and bicyclists are required to share the roadway with one another and pedestrians and utilize their vehicle turn signals or signal with their hands to indicate their intentions as they drive and ride through the streets of our community and are urged to stop and scan left, right, and left again for pedestrians before exiting driveways and alleys. And whereas pedestrians and bicyclists are, rec are recommended to wear bright and reflective clothing or bracelets, carry a flashlight or other lighting devices to increase their visibility at night, and whereas bicyclists and skateboarders under the age of 16 years are reminded Oregon law requires the use of safety helmets in any public street or sidewalk. And whereas motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists are reminded to stay alert and avoid distractions from cell phones or other mobile devices and keep their eyes and ears on the traffic. Now, therefore, I, Anna Peterson, mayor of the city of Salem, do hereby proclaim the second week of May 2016 as Traffic Safety Week. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Do you have a few words you would like to say? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> ben Bale, Salem Police. Uh, our trafficking, the city of Salem and the police department itself takes uh, traffic safety very seriously. We've obviously had a lot of issues with uh, pedestrian safety and pedestrian fatalities within the city. Uh, it started, we started it last month actually with, last month was distracted driving month and so we did a couple projects with the Oregon State Police, Marion County, Polk County and some other local agencies and we focused on Highway 22. Uh, we did east and west and, and did some projects there. We did two different projects. Uh, earlier today we did a live uh, chat with uh, the crime prevention unit and a traffic motor officer in order to do a live stream on Periscope in an effort to try to reach more people. 
Uh, this week on Thursday from 12 to 1, yeah, make sure I got the time right, we're going to do a traffic <laughs> chat or a Twitter chat with a traffic motor officer between 12 and 1 and anybody can ask a, a traffic question or really any question and a, and a motor officer will be on the other end and he'll try to answer those questions. And then the Three Flags campaign that we do in conjunction with ODOT, which focuses on distracted driving, seatbelt use, and speed, that starts Monday, May 16th, and runs for two weeks. So, so Well, excellent. I really appreciate the work that the department is doing and the collaboration with the sheriffs and the state police. It's always wonderful. We call this the collaboration capital, so it's always nice to know how well we do collaborate. So I'd like to present this proclamation to you, and I believe probably Angie wants us all to look at the camera so that you actually receive this proclamation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. It's live on Periscope right now. It is live. All right. Well, there, there we are. We are live. Thank you. And I see a helmet. Was that like the example for the bicyclist to wear? Oh, look at this. Oh, well, hold it up. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. All right. Our second proclamation has to do with an annual event that we're very happy to host here in Salem, and I believe it probably happens across the nation. And I would like to ask the gentleman and the lady from the fire department to come forward. This has to do with our muscular dystrophy fill the boot project, and I hope you have a boot. Did someone bring a boot? You did not bring a boot. Oh boy. Well, you could take, well, you brought your tennis shoes. <laughs> All right. Welcome, and you are? Fitzgerald. Ian Fitzgerald, and what is your rank or position in the fire department? I'm a captain with the City of Salem Fire, and uh, I've been the MDA coordinator for the past few years. So, Excellent. And how long have you been with our department? 16 years. 16 years. All right. So you've done this a few times. Well, we're happy to have you here and happy to be doing this. So I'm going to read this proclamation. Whereas muscular dystrophy refers to a group of more than 40 neuromuscular <coughs> diseases, and whereas the Muscular Dystrophy Association is a voluntary health agency that was created in 1950 by a driven group of parents whose children suffered from a form of muscular dystrophy. And whereas 75% of every dollar raised by the Muscular Dystrophy Association goes directly to research, health care, and education. And whereas local 314 firefighters annually hold fill the boot days in Salem, raising thousands of dollars to benefit children with neuromuscular diseases. Now therefore, I, Anna Peterson, mayor of the city of Salem, on behalf of the people of Salem, offer our best wishes to those living with neuromuscular disease and do hereby proclaim May 19th and 20th, 2016, to be fill the boot days in Salem, I encourage all people to participate by dropping money in the boot at one of the following intersections. Market Street Northeast at Lancaster Drive or Liberty Street at Trade. And this proclamation is dated this ninth day of May, 2016. And I'm happy to present this proclamation to you. I think we probably have a photo up going there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for, for the, your service, and thank you for bringing this proclamation back to the department. All right, thank you, All right, thank you so much. Our third proclamation is a very special proclamation, and I want to say how really touched I was when individuals from the community approached me and the city and said, this would be a good idea, and we certainly agreed. And I'm going to ask Steve Anderson to come forward. And are there others that were coming forward with you? I see E.M. Forrester, and I see, I see Josh Pollock. Oh, OK. They, they want to stay behind the scenes, all right? Well, Steve, welcome. And I appreciate you coming and being ready to receive this very special proclamation. Whereas the City of Salem relies on participation of citizen volunteers to guide the promulgation of public policies that improve the quality of life for all its citizens, 
And whereas in recent years, West Salem has benefited greatly from volunteers working with the West Salem Neighborhood Association and the West Salem Business Association. And whereas Janet Noakes served as the land use chair of the West Salem Neighborhood Association for five years, informing and guiding its actions on land use and development issues, and engaged the Edgewater area residents in their community. And whereas the Edgewater project has been a cooperative and collaborative effort of the City of Salem, the West Salem Neighborhood Association, and the West Salem Business Association. Whereas Janet Noakes is a well-regarded citizen participant in coordinating the efforts of the West Salem Neighborhood Association and the West Salem Business Association in providing citizen input into numerous land use, development, and rehabilitation efforts, thereby benefiting both the West Salem neighborhood and by extension, the entire city of Salem. Now therefore, I, Anna Peterson, Mayor of the City of Salem, on behalf of the people of Salem, do hereby declare that on May 9th, 2016, we recognize Janet Noakes Day. The City of Salem hereby expresses its deep thanks and appreciation for the important efforts expanded by her to permanently improve our city. And this is dated the ninth day of May, 2016. Steve, would you like to say a few words? All right, thank you. Mayor Peterson and City Council, my name is Steve Anderson, as you heard. I'm the co-chair of the West Salem Neighborhood Association, and I'm here on behalf of the Neighborhood Association, and I'm honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of Janet. Janet cannot be here tonight because of medical restrictions, but we are honored that the city has chose to acknowledge the importance of citizen volunteers and the role that the Neighborhood Association offers citizens to become involved in the community. The West Salem Neighborhood Association has a long and distinguished history of involvement in Salem. Janet Noakes, Noakes personifies that involvement. When she retired in 2005, Janet purchased a small home in the Edgewater area of West Salem and immediately sought out her neighbors to be a friend of them. Within a year, she joined the West Salem Neighborhood Association in an effort to gain recognition and support for her neighbors. Over the decade, Janet championed neighborhood gardens, the writing of the West Salem history, encouraging neighborhood cleanup pro projects, sim stimulating the creation of the Edgewater Project, served as the West Salem Neighborhood Association land use chair, and shepherded the writing of a monthly column in the West Salem side newspaper. The list can go on. But again, on behalf of the West Salem Neighborhood Association, we thank you, Mayor Peterson and city councilors, for honoring West Salem citizen Janet Noakes. Thank you so much, Steve. Let's take our picture here with the proclamation, and we'll look at the camera. Thank you. I really appreciate your efforts with this, and EM, your efforts, and, and also Josh. It is so important that we recognize when a citizen has really stepped forward and carried a load and led others, and we certainly do recognize Janet for that. Thank you so much. All right, our next order of business tonight is public comment, and I see that we have a couple of people that have signed up. So I'll call both names, and you may choose whichever podium you'd like to go to. Angela Obrey and Margot Lucas. Welcome, and you'll have three minutes. At the end of two minutes, the amber light comes on. At the end of three minutes, <laughs> the red light comes on, and we just need your uh, name and address or your ward number. So I'm Angela Obrey and I'm with the Salem Bike Boulevard Advocates. I live in Ward 1. I'm here tonight in honor of Traffic Safety Week. So I just want to thank the mayor for the proclamation and the reminder to all road users to stay alert, to be visible, be aware of their safety and the safety of other users. And I also wanted tonight to note the responsibility of those who design our roads, to use all of the tools that they have in their toolbox that truly can make our traffic safety a reality for all of our users, not just our private cars, but our public transit, our cyclists, 
our skateboarders and our pedestrians. Um, Salem Bike Boulevard Advocates has come here many times and told you we want a street design that provides true options for those seeking active transportation in our hometown. Um, you, can, you know me and you know my spiel. So um, what I've brought to you tonight is an invitation to mm -hmm. see some street design that I keep talking about. Last spring, we took a field trip uh, with a group of people up to the Portland uh, Neighborhood Greenways, which is a form of bike boulevard. And Councillor Dickey joined us, and Public Works Director Peter Fernandez joined us, and we were able to kind of see for ourselves what those design elements are that truly change the game for bicyclists and for pedestrians. We're gonna do that again. We have a field trip scheduled for June 26th up in Portland. It's a Sunday and I hope you will come and bring your bike and bring your loved ones. It'll be about a two hour ride uh, where we'll be able to see uh, truly people friendly neighborhood streets. Um, we'll also have a active transportation public, uh, let's see what his title, active transportation traffic safety specialist with us to answer questions for people. And that day is also uh, the um, Portland Parkways, which is an open streets event, is at that same time, and it'll be near our route. So people who wanna stay and enjoy that can kind of have double exposure if they'd like. But um, I encourage you to come and I um, encourage you to talk to those who came with us last year. Uh, it'll be very much the same program, but just an opportunity for folks to see uh, what's possible here in our own hometown. Wonderful, well thank you very much. And don't go away because I, I have the, the luxury of having this uh, printed notice to me. And I wonder, uh, I see your email address on here. Maybe you could tell us uh, and tell the people watching how they might contact you if they have questions. And do you have a website? Thank you. So our um, Facebook, we have a Facebook page, Salem Bike Boulevard Advocates. Um, and you can also email us at bikeboulevards at gmail.com. And if you send me your email, I will respond with all the information about the trip as well as add you to our e-newsletter that goes out about every other month with information. Um, the uh, printed uh, invitations were provided for all of the counselors tonight. I've also passed on a digital version uh, to the Public Works Director and will be sending you it in digital form as well. So you can pass it on to constituents that you know are interested in your wards. Wonderful. Uh, counselors have questions, I think. Councillor Bennett? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, Angela, uh, thank you very much for the work you do. You actually make sure that this is more than uh, uh, traffic safety week. It tends to be traffic safety year, and you really appreciate the work you do. Uh, and you've really been a, a tremendous leader in helping us on a whole batch of issues, uh, particularly on the Bike Boulevard. I really can't thank you enough. Are there other events associated with uh, Traffic Safety Week that are going on that you're aware of you want to mention? Thank you, yeah. So next uh, Tuesday, that's May 17th at 7 p.m., the Salem Progressive Film Series is actually showing a documentary called Bikes Versus Cars. And at that uh, film, then afterwards, we're actually gonna have a Q&A and some guest speakers to talk about bikes and cars, maybe not bikes versus cars, bikes and cars here in Salem. So I encourage anybody to come to that. Um, I will say also is that on May 28th, so it's um, later on in the month, the SBBA is actually having a, what we're calling kind of our own version of a slow roll, which is, uh, it's a Saturday at 1 p.m. We're gonna gather at Inglewood Park for folks who would like to ride down to Riverfront Park but would like to do so with somebody that could show them some roads that are more family friendly um, and more for maybe not the brave and the strong, but the interested but concerned writer. And so we encourage people to come to that as well. Looking far out, it's not SBBA, but I know there is a group planning um, an open streets event on Saturday, July 30th. It's called the Salem Greenway. And SBBA's interest in that is that that open street event is on the Bike Boulevard Maple Winter Path that was funded through the ODOT grant for planning. So it's an opportunity for people to come out and ride that route and see it before the beautiful transformation that I'm hoping will happen. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you very much. Councilor Dickey. 
Hi, Angela. Thanks for coming Hi. down. Um, and I'm really happy to see that you guys are doing this again. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who hasn't done this, this is really worth your time because you get to see so many different things. It's not that it's one solution. There's, there's so many different things that have been done. It really can kind of spark some ideas about what we could do in here and in here in Salem. So I'm super excited that you're doing this again and I really um, appreciate that. So thank you so much for all of your work. Um, I'm thinking as you're talking about a slow roll, I'd love to have a slow roll going down Portland Road, kind of my route, my bike route, you know, across the freeway. I'd love to see what that would look like with lots of people who are riding safely in the bike lanes and, you know, trying to navigate traffic. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm really excited for this and, and all of the um, different activities you guys are doing throughout the city. Um, I think you really are making a difference um, for bicycle travelers throughout our city. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Were there other questions or comments? All right. Thank you for coming down. And I, I just want to take a moment to say you know that uh, this was on our desks. I think all the counselors were, re uh, were given a copy from our police department. Thank you very much. This is the state of Oregon, Oregon pedestrian bicycle and driver rules. And I would imagine that this is available maybe through our police department or through ODOT if uh, people who are watching tonight would like to get a copy of this. They can do their nodding their heads, yes. You can find out by calling the police department or calling Oregon Department of Transportation and uh, get a copy yourself. It has a lot of great diagrams and, and a lot of tips and rules and regulations that will help us all on this road toward being safer drivers, safer walkers, safer skateboarders, and having a safer community. So I want to plug that book. Thank you for bringing that to us. Uh, Margo Lucas, you're signed up. Oh, you want to pass? Yes, thank you. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Nice to see you always. All right. We'll move along to the consent calendar. Councillor McCoy, do you have a motion for us regarding the consent calendar? Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, I move approval of the consent calendar with the following poll. 3.2A by Councillor Anderson. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councillor McCoy and seconded by Councillor Bednars to approve the consent calendar with the item 3.2A pulled by Councillor Anderson. Councillor McCoy, would you like to describe the consent calendar this with evening? Consent calendar, we've got the minutes from the April 25th uh, council meeting the item we pulled, and then uh, we've got uh, an inter uh, recommended action of an authorized the city manager enter into an intergovernmental agreement with Marion Soil and Water Conservation District to fund the treatment of invasive plants along Salem Streams in Marion County, and if you read the report, specifically knotweed, which I then Googled to Japanese knotweed, which I Googled to see what the heck that was. Nasty. It is. It's not knotweed. <laughs> All right. Yeah, That's thing. it. <laughs> is that it? Yes. All right. Thank you. The motion on the floor is to adopt the consent calendar with the item 3.2A uh, move to special orders of business. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. <coughs> motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We will now move to the public hearing for A. Would the recorder please introduce the public hearing? The Salem City Council will now hold a public hearing for the purpose of receiving <coughs> public testimony regarding adoption of the 2016-2017 Housing and Community Development Action Plan, use of Community Development Block Grant and Home Investment Partnership Funds to assist low to moderate income households. The hearing will be conducted with the staff presentation first, followed by other interested persons. Thank you very much. And I see Rena Peck is here. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council. I'm Rena Peck, Federal Programs Manager for Urban Development. The purpose of uh, tonight's public hearing is to discuss the 2016-2017 Annual Action Plan and provide an opportunity for public comment. The annual plan addresses funding goals and priorities identified in the 2015-2019 Consolidated Plan. 
During the development of the consolidated plan, staff engaged the community through meetings with the majority of neighborhood associations, local stakeholders, a community-wide uh, survey monkey, and outreach to the Wednesday market, as well as various types of um, publications. The annual action plan is an implementation of the goals identified in the 2015-2019 consolidated plan. Community outreach for the annual action plan was not as extensive as the, as the consolidated plan. However, annual plan, um, the annual action plan outreach consisted of contacting various social service agencies, attendance at an array of community uh, meetings, published notices, website publications, and a notice on the city's uh, Facebook page as well as a 30-day comment period that occurred prior to tonight's meeting. The city solicits funding requests, applications through community outreach and its applications, um, and the applications the city receives is instrumental in the creation of the annual action plan. Each application is vetted through regulatory requirements and then provided to the Community Services and Housing Commission for analysis and funding recommendations to the city council. The Community Services and Housing Commission analyzed, an, analyzed each application based on one, the consolidated plan goals, two, is the project um, or program financially feasible, three, does the organization collaborate within the community, and lastly, community need. During the Community Services and Housing Commission public meetings, the commission um, took the opportunity for input from the public as well. The amounts available for the 2016-2017 um, awards include HUD entitlement and um, project cost savings from prior years. Every year in November, as I mentioned before, the application cycle begins and organizations are encouraged to apply. Once the city receives the application, staff reviews them for regulatory eligibility before forwarding to the Community Services and Housing Commission for their review and, and analysis. The applic application cycle has closed. Community Services and the Housing Commission and the Urban Development Director are recommending funding the proposed projects outlined in the annual plan. As you can tell by the, this particular side, slide, the city was undersubscribed in CDBG and oversubscribed in home. The unallocated portion of CDBG funds has been set aside for potential cost increases in the um, housing projects one for the housing authority and the other for a um, um, housing project for, for re-entry of uh, women into the community. The annual plan proposed projects range in funding for small businesses through microenterprise education, microenterprise lending, direct services to low to moderate income individuals and families and providing decent affordable housing for women re-entering the community. The projects funded this year include Shelley's House. They received $300,000 um, 300, for uh, repairs to their facility. It has six units, housing units. Merit Job Savers, it's a welding education program. Merit itself and um, interface microenterprise training. Community Lending Works, works is a branch of NEDCO. They're receiving funding for microenterprise lending. The um, Center for Hope and Safety for case management. Congregations Helping People for Direct Assistance, Salem Interfaith Hospitality Network, those are all through CDBG. Home, again, Salem Interfaith Hospitality for Direct um, Rental Assistance. Catholic Community Services is doing a demolition and reconstruction. Um, and Catholic Community Services receiving funding for operating. The proposed projects will provide various types of assistance to approximately 2,500 individuals and families within Salem and Kaiser. These projects assist low to moderate income citizens with economic, social, and housing needs. The Community Services and Housing Commission reviewed and analyzed general fund applications along with CDBG and HOME. The Commission made social service general funding recommendations to Council and to the Budget Committee on May 4th. Though it is not a requirement of the annual action plan, these funds provide a comprehensive picture of the city's in investment in the community. Social service funding provides safety, emergency, safety net emergency services to the homeless or those at risk of homelessness. The programs proposed to be funded by the city's general fund are mentioned in the plan and leveraged against the C um, Salem CDBG grant. 
The Community Services and Housing Commission made social service funding recommendations based on these priorities. These programs will provide the majority of services to individuals who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. 4,100 or 41,000, sorry, residents are expected to be served through case management, helping um, families find services, and direct assistance like emergency housing needs, health concerns, or food. Prior to this public hearing, a, a comment period notice was published to inform citizens of Salem and Kaiser that the city is soliciting comments. As of today, the city has received one comment. That comment, along with staff response, has been provided to you. The comments and responses will be included in the final publication of the 2016-2017 annual plan that will be submitted to HUD on the 15th of May. Staff recommend City Council adopt the 2016-2017 um, annual action plan and approve submission to HUD. Thank you. Thank you very much. We certainly appreciate the thoroughness of your report and the um, timeliness as well as the Mid Willamette Initiative on Homeless Task Force has begun its work and you're, you and your department and the Housing Authority are a very important part of the solution to this. All right, we now have time for public hearing and then we will come back to Ms. Peck for any questions uh, from staff. And I see three people have signed up. The first is Paul, and excuse me, Paul, if I'm not saying your name correctly. Just as it's spelled. <laughs> how well, how well for you? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> Welcome, and you have three minutes. At the end of two minutes, the amber <coughs> light comes on, and at the end of three minutes, the red light comes on. So please um, educate me as to how to pronounce your name. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Paul Pelequin. I'm a board member with uh, Shelley's House, Inc. We're located at 966 Capitol Northeast. And I'm here tonight to uh, speak in support of adoption of the Housing and uh, Community Development Action Plan. Shelley's House is a CDBG grant uh, under consideration by the council. Monies, uh, if awarded, would be used to renovate our transitional housing facility. <coughs> Shelley's House is an all-volunteer organization pr that provides safe, drug-free transitional housing for women offenders at risk of homelessness in Marion County. The 17-bed facility serves 45 to 60 women annually and typically provides over 4,700 nights of housing a year. We've been providing this housing quietly and reliably since 1995. The population served is women who are currently under the supervision of Marion County community corrections for criminal activity and substance abuse. They're relatively new in their recovery. They're at risk for homelessness and relapse. The majority of mothers who continue to have contact with their children and are working to reunite with those children. They need safe, affordable, substance-free housing during this transition. And if the women who come to Shelley's house had another safe place to go, they would be going to that place. We really are taking uh, kind of last chance women. So this is how uh, Shelley's House involvement uh, would assist in the city's uh, five-year consolidation plan. Uh, ending homelessness. Shelley's House provides safe, substance-free transitional housing for approximately 60 women offenders each year and links those residents to community partners that build self-sufficiency and contribute to a healthy reentry. In Marion County, there are 6,400 offenders under the supervision of Marion County Parole and Probation. 19% of those are women. In the next year, the projection is just over 70 additional women will be released from state corrections into Marion County, plus the women who are released from jail. When they are first released, many do not have a safe, substance-free home to go to or any money in their pocket to pay for this type of housing. Goal three, uh, affordable housing. Shelley's house has 17 beds, providing an average of 4,700 nights annually for women offenders recovering from substance abuse. Residents are all below poverty or very low income when they leave incarceration and enter the program. 
Shelley's House Grant Project also touches on the City of Salem's goal for sustaining and rehabilitating existing transitional housing, as well as making energy efficient improvements to those housings. And goal number four, revitalization of neighborhoods. Shelley's House is located at 966 Capitol Street Northeast, near the corner of Capitol and D. The property fronts Capitol Street, so it's highly visible to people walking or driving north on downtown. The renovation would uh, revitalize that neighborhood. Thank you. Your time is up, but I want to say thank you so much for your service on that board of directors. I want to say thank you to you and to the board and the volunteer staff at Shelley's House. You invited me over, gave me a great tour. I really enjoyed and appreciated having time to talk with some women who live there. And I can tell you, I, I believe truly that the transitional services that you're providing will make a difference in women's lives. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Are there questions from any counselors? Great work. All right, great work, everybody says. All right. Rick Gapo is our next uh, speaker. Welcome, Mr. Gapo. Always nice to have you here. Thank you so much. And just uh, wanted to thank you for the earlier conversation because I rode my bike here, so I appreciate the safety <laughs> conversation. Oh, so. right. There you are. Which has nothing to do with what I was going to talk about. So. Well, it's still a good thing to talk about. Yeah. Welcome. And you know, three minutes, two minutes, the amber light, third right. minute, red light. I'm uh, Rick Gapo, uh, CEO of Marion Polk Food Chair, and the food chair is in Ward 5. Um, I, I, I want to come here in support of the plan and also to thank the city. Um, as you know, you guys are, I think, uh, um, right now are, are just about to be part of a food, uh, the citywide food drive. You support our work um, in partnership at the 50 Plus Center with Meals on Wheels. Um, and very significantly through this plan, you support the hungry families in our community. I was just at the National Food Banking Conference in Houston, and the speaker there reminded me of something that frankly I had forgotten, which is food banks across the nation, and this is true in Salem, touch more lives than probably any other social service organization, 30,000 people approximately receiving food. And I want to remind you and thank you that when this is, there's an adage, which is, I don't know if it's an adage, but when you have food in your belly, you have many problems. But when you're hungry, you only have one problem. And what you're really doing is you're helping people face all the other problems and, and support and the concentration on housing. I think that's spot on because housing and hunger are so close related. Mm -hmm. but, but hunger is immensely important and you're making a difference by supporting this plan. Um, about 30,000 individuals are the number of people that will support this year about 400,000 meals. Um, and you can think of each one of those meals that you help make happen as an offset to a cost that allows them to have money for housing, for car payments, for school supplies, or whatever it is. So th this was a, a, a great process. And I also want to uh, appreciate the, uh, the council or the committee that did the work, especially uh, Jean um, Pom Pom Jean. Palmer Tier, thank Palmer you, mm -hmm. and Adam and Collier for their work on the committee and just the lead that they took. It was a good experience. So thank you guys so much. Well, thank you. I believe that we have some questions. I want to say thank you so Great. much for the work that Marion Polk Food Chair is doing. In particular, I really want to give a shout out to the fact that you so attend to the nutritional quality of the food, and that is so important. It isn't just a concept of you know fill them up so they're not hung not hungry an hour or two hours later. Nutrition is truly vital for people's health and well-being, so thank you for seeing to that. We, I just saw a report today about 78% of all of our food we distribute is what we call nutritious, and about 22% is, is frankly pastries and um, white bread and other things. Mm -hmm. um, that's a shift over the last 10 years, um, and we're actually trying to figure out whether we're going to even value that other 22% anymore. We still do, mm -hmm. because right now mm -hmm. uh, we don't solicit it, we don't put any kind of effort in getting it in the door or out the door, but it comes to us, um, and we're actually trying to figure out if we're going to continue even that model. Wonderful. That's important. I think I saw some hands up. Counselors. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thanks for coming down. Been reading different things on canned goods. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason why they have dates on them, it's as far as you know they've changed to the best before yep. 
uh, because that's when it could lose some of the characteristics uh, that would have the highest level of uh, experience with the eater of said canned goods. Sure. A lot of people will throw those away when they've passed that date. They should definitely not do that. What is, is there any date range that you won't take? Because I've heard, seen 50-year-old no, no, cans, they open them up no, and they're fine. No, canned goods. So on canned goods, uh, the only thing we don't take is punctured or rusted. So everything else on canned goods is great because what the issue is, is what you said is the experience and not the nutritional quality. So um, uh, uh, food banks, again, man, put food share right here. Rest of the nation was right here. Uh, canned goods were the staple of the of, of, of food banks. Um, now, actually, it's fresh produce. So we still take canned yep. goods, we concent but we concentrate on um, produce as much as everything else. And about 40% of everything we distribute now is fresh produce. Excellent. So, I'll be planting a row for you. Yeah, we, we would love that. We actually we work with farmers in Hunger and Salem Harvest and um, yep. farmers um, um, across the two county area. It, it makes a big difference. Excellent. Thank you much. Wonderful. Thank you for mentioning the farmers. I know that this is an agricultural community and they've been very generous, they're, very they're supportive. Incredibly generous, so. Wonderful, that's great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so for much coming for down. the support of this plan. You're very welcome. Adam Kohler, am I saying that name correctly? And then there's another gentleman I believe that wanted to speak to. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, yes, my name is Adam Kohler, just like the faucets. Unfortunately, I'm not related to them. Uh, I am in Ward 4, and I am the Vice Chair for the Community Services and Housing Commission. Um, oh. I'm here today, obviously, in support of a plan that we spent a lot of time and effort on. Um, I didn't have any prepared remarks. I thought, I thought I'd be here um, just to present myself, uh, talk a little bit about the process, and open it up for any questions that you may or may not have. Um, I did want to point out that this was a very difficult process. Um, there is not enough money. There's a lot of need. You guys are all nodding your heads. You, you appreciate mm -hmm. this as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to point out that we did a, have a very collaborative process. Uh, there was some great discussion with community members. We have a, a pretty open um, meeting for, uh, format. Uh, not every vote was unanimous, um, but we, I do believe, made the right decisions uh, moving forward. Obviously, as a vice chair, I support every decision that we make as a, as a commission. Um, along those lines, a lot of the, idea, the ideas that we promote are um, maximizing that dollar and supporting the programs that support other programs. Um, Rick uh, mentioned so all of that help that they do um, in our community. And uh, the idea is that um, a financial con contribution to the Marion Park Food Share will also uh, assist a lot of those programs that also um, put in applications for funding. Uh, but along those lines, Marion Polk uh, supports and can stretch that dollar a lot more than um, some of the other organizations that we supported. Um, I guess that was the, the thought process and a lot of the, the discussion. Um, and I would open it up. Like I said, I don't have any prepared remarks, but if you had any questions for me, um, I'd be happy to take those. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your service on that board and your leadership. It's very important. Councilor Anderson? Thank you. I echo what the mayor said. I happened to come to one of those meetings to listen to the presentations on an um, afternoon, the block grant presentations. I was very impressed by two things. One, the dedication that the people on the committee gave to it and the consideration and the discussions that you all had and also by what you've also mentioned is the obvious need. And I think this is a terrific service that you're helping us provide for the community and I'd love it if we could provide more. So thanks for your service. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Bennett. Thank you. I just want to echo uh, Councillor Anderson's comments. I also had a chance to go and listen to the presentations. I thought it was uh, uh, really well done uh, and uh, really edifying. It's it's worth hearing the the uh, various programs. I was real taken with the variety of programs you have to consider. So I, I thought it was well done. Thank you. Uh, obviously, the, the the most difficult part was having to say no. Yeah. And uh, I remember the the refer very first one. Excuse me that we had where um, there was that long pause where nobody wanted to be the first to speak because we had to cut something uh, and the person that breaks that ice uh, is the bad guy in that yeah. situation. But um, again, uh, those decisions had to be made. Well, thank you. I know it's tough duty when you do have to be the group that has to say no, but your wise counsel, your wise decisions do make a tremendous difference and help us to spread those dollars. So thank you, thank you so much. 
Yes, and we have another gentleman who wanted to speak. <coughs> Please come forward, and if you'll state your name and your address or your ward. Yes, I'm TJ Pubman, the director of Interfaith Hospitality Network on right. Edgewater Street, at 1055 Edgewater Street in Ward 1, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to speak in support of the consolidated plan. It's been amazing to see how the city of Salem has been able to come alongside families going through homelessness, families that are going through the hardest time in their life. You guys have heard that homelessness is hard, but it's especially devastating for families. Uh, I'm not sure if the email went around, but recently uh, I sent one up the Urban Development Change, and I'm not sure how far it went, but we were able to get 10-year-old Maya, who was living with her dad and her brother in their car. Uh, dad was doing everything he could to provide for them, but he just couldn't make it work with the income he was he had. Uh, we're the only shelter in town that would be able to take him on an emergency basis with his kids. And within 10 days, through his hard work, the partnership of the city, and the resources that we were able to unite through uh, the Interfaith Hospitality Network, the congregations, um, and people. My four-year-old Maya was in her own home in 10 days. Uh, it's not an accident. You guys have make a big, big difference. Uh, by helping programs like ours and others listed in the consolidated plan. Um, the amount of resources that we are able to leverage as well, uh, not just through the tenant-based rental assistance where we're able to spend, we're, we found that it cost about $3,500 to get a family out of homelessness, um, and then about another $40,000 to, to keep a family in their own home by helping them build their resources to where they can sustain it long term. Families need that immediate one time assistance. Homelessness is a housing problem, and that if you have the money to pay for a house, you can stay there. Uh, without this program, there are 45 families that wouldn't have a place to go. Uh, mm -hmm. Since April 1st, our emergency shelter program has turned away 52 families that have nowhere else to go. Uh, some of them are doubled up, some of them are. Uh, sleeping in their car and some of them are even sleeping on the streets uh, it's hard right now for families but without the city there would be 45 more families struggling uh, you guys also provide case management for our shelter program mm -hmm. and we're the first shelter in the in the Northwest that it can actually take the entire family including the four-legged furry family members so I brought patches our mascot uh, to where if a we know homelessness is hard where kids are able to keep their pets with them as well. Uh, we're able to come together as a community and make a big difference in lives. And without the work you guys do through your federal programs, um, there would be more families that struggle. But we make a big difference. And I wanted to thank you guys for your help with that. So I'm going to pass the Thank you. Around. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, don't go away because other counselors may have questions or comments. I certainly have a comment, and that is to thank you, TJ. Thank you personally and on behalf of the city for all the work that you've done, not only with the Interfaith Hospitality Network, but with so many of the organizations and the network that really does help people in our community. I've seen you in action in the shelters in the daytime and in the nighttime and in the snowy blizzard, and I just want to tell you how much we appreciate what you've done and, and how really hospitality and interfaith, interfaith hospitality network has grown and become a very serious and important part of the sheltering system here. And oh my goodness, well, nobody can compete there. with the dog, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. It's yes. the congregations. We have 18 congregations that all host families and another 16 that come alongside in another way. Uh, lots of churches are making a difference in the lives of families, so I'm honored to yes. see lives change, whether it be the families we're serving. It's wonderful. <laughs> oh my goodness. You may not be getting this dog back. I apologize for the counselor's behaviors. <laughs> He's seen worse, I think. All right. Thank you again Thank you for coming. Appreciate all your work. All right. Was there anyone else here this evening that did want to speak and didn't have a chance to get signed up? All right, then we will move along for the questions we may have for staff member Rena Peck. And I see Councillor Anderson's hand is up. Thank you very much for the report, Rena. And I'm, I, I'm particularly thankful for what I think I heard you say that the um, the um, long um, 
comments from Sarah Owens and Michael Livingston will, in fact, be included uh, as an addendum to the report or in the report, as well as I believe this is probably a city staff response that comes after it? Yes, you are correct. They will be included in the document that's submitted to HUD, so okay. both her comments and the city's response well, will be Well, there. that's terrific because, you know, we got this, or I looked at it today at about 4 o'clock, and it was obviously written by two lawyers, and uh, it's very thorough, and, and I appreciate also the response, but I just haven't had time, and I don't think any of the other counselors have really had time to look into this, and both the comments from um, uh, uh, Sarah and Michael, and also the response from the staff. So, um, you know, I had thought maybe I'd move to make it an addendum, <laughs> and I understand we have to get it to the uh, HUD by the 15th. Yes. So we don't have chance to postpone it and look at it and get a response. So the fact that this is going to be included in there, both mm -hmm. um, the comments and then also the city response, I think that's completely appropriate. And uh, I'll thank you for doing that. Yes, and we've um, taken a look, you know, really thorough look at um, her comments and anything that we could add to the plan we've done. So um, there's a couple of places there where she um, had mentioned that we didn't um, um, identify some uh, agencies that um, we had collaborated with, so we made sure to add them. Um, her comments were specifically to ones who weren't funded, and so we added those into the plan as well as. Um, so, in other words, it's not just an addendum; it somehow will affect the, the 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 final plan. Yes. Which is not then the one that we got in our packet. So there'll be some changes made. Yes, and we'll okay. make sure that you get the final one. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I also uh, uh, am glad you're going to incorporate this into the plan. I thought that was, I'm really pleased you're doing that and that you were able to capture some of the uh, specific uh, comments by uh, uh, Sarah Owens and Michael Livingston. Uh, clearly they went to a lot of trouble in, in really reading the plan carefully and commenting and I think it's very helpful. One of the suggestions that really jumped out at me uh, was the suggestion that there be an ongoing process of consultation that goes on during the year? Will that be the kind? Does that occur? Or uh, it, it sort of indicated that it possibly wasn't. It was more of an annual catching up with everybody kind of meeting. But I, I thought the suggestion of that kind of an, of, of that kind of regular process discussion sounded really helpful. Is that the kind of thing that you incorporated? Yes, staff is always involved in the community all year long. So we are attending various social service meetings or um, different things that come up. We have in the past actually even volunteered at the Homeless Connect that occurs in March. So we really try to try to stay engaged with the community, not just just at one time at one time a year when when they apply for funding so it's really important I believe for us to um, make sure that we know what's going on throughout the year to end up with a better product at the end of the day the, the other question I have is really <coughs> pardon me mm -hmm. the housing first model mm -hmm. which is one that is certainly uh, uh, discussed widely mm -hmm. uh, nationally and I it appears locally um, Will we be getting during the year maybe a discussion from you all about kind of how that model is being put on the ground uh, or is it, do, do you know what I'm saying? We can um, bring some information back to you like in uh, mid-year if you would like on information that we can gather. You know, we don't um, actually have boots on the ground. There's not enough of us to go out there and actually right. implement those types of things. But we can certainly bring you back information that we know is going on in the community. I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. We hear at the end of each year at this point when we go through this process what's going on like with the interfaith mm -hmm. network. I think uh, hearing about it in process is also helpful for us to know if we're, I mean, are there course corrections that ought to be going on or anything that we should be doing and it gives the, uh, since we have stopped having the reports we used to get monthly, mm -hmm. you know, from the various social service agencies, I think it'd be helpful for us to hear about kind of what's going on in these various programs, particularly right now, the housing programs. What are we doing and how's it going and do you have any ideas that uh, have come, that have sort of floated up or uh, the, the 
45 families that didn't get a home ought to be cut to 35 and we could do this little thing that would solve that problem. Do you, yes. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I, we, I think that'd be helpful. We have, um, there's uh, Laura Walker, who is uh, my staff with Fertile Program. She's actually assisting um, the mayor with the initiative. So she's a, a part of that whole task force as well. So we not only have other things that we're involved in, but she's bringing a lot of information back through that right. process. So we'll make sure that we will give some information to you about midway through the year. Great, thank I'd you like very much. Were there other uh, questions? Councillor Bednars. I have some particular interest. I know that you've put a lot of work into this, into the detail of trying to figure out where to prioritize funding. One of the things that I was particularly looking at was the, at the 30,000 foot view was how much money was being spent on administration to, uh, to help resolve the three goals that you are trying to handle within this document. Priority of uh, uh, promote economic development and ending homelessness and expanding affordable housing. And I uh, see there's a $251,000 for administration, which is about 9.2% of the total that you're going to be spending, which is actually a very good number, saying that you're not spending as much in administration as, as um, I've seen on some other programs. Can you talk to, talk to me a little bit about the loan guarantee, what that is about? So um, years ago when the conference center was constructed, the city took out a um, section 108 loan from HUD, which HUD allows you to, the, um, a jurisdiction to borrow seven times their entitlement. And so it was about, you know, seven million. So it was more my time, so I don't know all of the details. So it was about seven million or so um, that they borrowed for the construction. So um, the city has to pay that back and they use their um, program income that we received from CDBG to make that 108 payment. So what you're seeing here is that 108 payment. So that money was used originally for? Um, with the construction of the conference center. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how does that deal with homelessness and and uh, well, it, it created jobs, so okay, it was part of economic development. development. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for your very thorough report and all the work that you're doing. I would like to add a, a special thank you to you and, and to the staff at the um, Housing Authority for the work that you're doing to assist with the Mid Willamette homeless initiative task force Thank you. and in answer to Councillor Bennett's question about um, housing first that is one of the um, emphasis that the federal government and HUD have specified and so we on that task force are looking at that in fact have already had some presentations about it and we're very cognizant that that is considered a best practice and we're uh, looking at some of the other communities and to see how that's been implemented and um, see how we can make that work in this community. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, we will now have a vote uh, for the public hearing. I have to close the public hearing, right? All right, and then an entertain a motion from Councillor McCoy regarding the um, uh, recommend, recommended action. Yes, Madam Mayor, I move the staff for recommendation. Second. It's been moved by Councillor McCoy and seconded by Councillor Bednars to move the staff recommendation. And is there discussion? Councillors? No. I see no hands. All right. We're ready for the motion. All those in favor of the motion of the recommended action to adopt the 2016-17 Housing and Community Development Annual Action Plan. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, we will move to special orders of business. Give everybody a little chance here to uh, exit. Thank you again for your participation this evening. Thank you. All right, uh, special orders of business is item 3.2A, which was pulled from the consent calendar. And I believe Councillor Anderson will have a motion regarding that. Yes, I do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I yes. move that we adopt the recommended action to adopt resolution number 2016-09, which refers ordinance number 5-16 to Salem voters for the November 
2016 general election adopts the measure and explanatory statement and directs the city attorney to draft the ballot title. Second. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Anderson and seconded by Councillor Bednars to um, adopt resolution number 2016-9, which refers ordinance 1516 to the Salem voters for the November 2016 general election. And Councillor Anderson, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, I would. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, I pulled this just because uh, we've had quite a lot of discussion in uh, the year and a half nearly that I've been on council and then about a year and a half before that on various issues surrounding the whole situation with both medical and recreational marijuana. And, um, you know, at one point we passed something to say we were going to see if we could tax it 10 percent <laughs> and then for various uh, legal reasons we decided we're following what the state says, which is we're entitled to tax it up to 3 percent to bring the total tax to 25 per excuse me, 20 percent. And uh, I'm very much in favor of that. And uh, um, I do have a question or two for the city attorney, if I could go ahead and ask those now. Certainly. Uh, it, it sounds like, Dan, that since this is a city ballot measure, any legal challenge goes actually to the city municipal court and there's no AG involvement, no circuit court involvement uh, uh, on what might happen if someone doesn't like the way the ballot measure uh, is titled and the explanation is given. Uh, Dan Atchison, City Attorney. That's correct. The, the challenge of the ballot title would go to the Salem Municipal Court. Okay. And is, is there an appeal from that or is that just it? Um, it could be appealed. Okay. To the Circuit Court or Court of Appeals? I, I, that's a good question. I, okay. I, I would uh, think the Circuit Court. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, oh by the way, I thought that was a good explanation too. So uh -huh. I'm not going to be challenging it. <laughs> All right. Other comments or questions? Councillor Bennett. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is uh, really tangential to the specifics of this, uh, of this particular uh, resolution, but where are we on the broader question of recreational sales? When will we see uh, changes for that ordinance, or are we looking forward to that? Dan Atchison, City Attorney, yes, there in your packet there's a future report um, okay. with an ordinance proposing uh, regulations for recreational retail sales. Um, okay. That would come before you for first reading at the next meeting, and the staff recommendation is that you would schedule a public hearing probably uh, towards the end of June, the June 20th or 27th meeting. So interested parties can find it on on our uh, website now, on our agenda for tonight, and That's can correct. see what the schedule looks like for that. Uh, the reason I'm asking, uh, I'm starting to get inquiries about this, and uh, what will be the rules of the game as people can cite uh, recreational sales, particularly in the core area of the community, and I'm interested. I know they are, so I'll be... I thank you very much for the hard work you've done getting this ready. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have a, a comment that I'd like to make, in fact, a recommendation with regard to this motion, and that is that I would, I would request that the revenue generated from the tax on the sale of recreational marijuana would be earmarked for uh, use for law enforcement purposes. And the reason I'd like to bring this forward is because that would really bring it in, con in line with the rules that we have um, regarding alcohol and, and tobacco taxes, which come to the city and which the city does earmark and, and specify for law enforcement uses because of the result of the uh, actions that need to be taken when there are violations with alcohol and tobacco. And I think that the medical, that the recreational marijuana should sort of be under the same uh, sphere and I would like to see those funds uh, dedicated so that law enforcement, particularly the Salem Police Department, would be able to use those funds as their duties and responsibilities are being expanded because of the um, availability or the uh, soon-to-be-available 
recreational marijuana. And I was wondering maybe if the chief, Chief Moore, would you be able to just speak for a couple minutes about some of the things that the department um, is doing and will be doing in conjunction with um, really monitoring the recreational use of marijuana in the community. Thank you, Mayor, Council, Jerry Moore, Chief of Police. Um, I, we're a little early in the game to see exactly what's going to occur uh, with recreational marijuana simply because um, um, we're not totally there yet. Uh, I think we look back to, I think we look at Colorado as a good uh, um, example of what we can expect. I think uh, there's certainly going to be issues of uh, the sale of marijuana outside of uh, medical or recreational um, establishments that we will continue to have to enforce uh, when we get complaints. Uh, my biggest concern would be um, impaired driving, and we are certainly going to have to train uh, more uh, drug recognition experts to uh, deal with that issue. Uh, we currently have uh, some uh, going through training as we speak, uh, but I think that's going to be one of the areas that we're certainly going to have to um, increase our numbers of trained personnel. And then uh, I think there will be a, some demand for education and prevention as far as, as far as maybe in the high schools or some of those locations as we move forward. But uh, I think right now, I, uh, without having experienced it, <coughs> as some other states have, I think we're kind of a wait and see period. But uh, I'm sure there are going to be um, situations where law enforcement is going to have to be involved in, uh, in enforcement uh, in this situation. Thank you. Would um, educational and prevention projects be part of our DARE program or part of any other outreach where I know the officers are working in the schools always with the school resource officers? Would that maybe be part of their programs? Uh, I, I would think that would be, uh, and of course that would be in conjunction with Salem Kaiser Schools on, on what they're requesting from us. Uh, certainly that's part of our DARE program now and um, we will just have to see. Uh, uh, for instance, we've given training on uh, um, oxycodone and, and the movement to, uh, to heroin uh, and we've given training classes on that. So there could be a variety of classes similar to that, not that they're associated, but uh, there could be demand for people, from people wanting us to give uh, a variety of training classes. Excellent, thank you, thank you very much. Councilor Bennett. <coughs> uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, to understand, um, are you uh, proposing to make this part of the measure, or would you like to have a sense of the council that this is the direction we'd go if this were to pass? I, I just wanted to make sure I understood where you wanted to go. Well, we haven't had a chance to really discuss as a council okay. what, what we would, but I would welcome that discussion. We can probably <laughs> do that this evening, I believe. Is that under the authority of well, what we're doing tonight? There, there, are, there are different ways to approach it. I'd maybe rely on uh, the city manager and the budget officer for help on this, but um, the, the ordinance itself doesn't allocate the money to any specific purpose. And right now what you're doing is adopting the resolution to refer it to the voters. The explanatory statement um, states that the, the funds are just go into the general fund and may be used for any lawful purpose. So if you're going to amend the ordinance or do other some sort of action that would earmark the money or require it to go to a certain use, the explanatory statement needs to be accurate and consistent with that. So if that is council's desire to do that, you need to do that first. Don't approve this resolution tonight. And then we need to make sure the explanatory statement matches up with whatever um, council's uh, direction is. The, the deadline uh, to get this done is, going, is coming up fairly quickly. Um, but you have time. The, the, the deadline to submit it to the county um, elections officials is, um, I believe, September. So you've got some time if you want to get an ordinance adopted or, or amending the ordinance you already adopted <laughs> to, to add this in, or if there's another way to do it, you could do it through the budget process annually as well. Um, that wouldn't require an ordinance amendment. And, and currently the, the proceeds are in the police department's budget in the fiscal year 16-17 proposed budget. But I, if I understood the mayor's uh, proposal, she would like to have it uh, permanently assigned mm -hmm. to the police department, right. not just an annual, if I understood that correctly. Right, I, I would propose that it be permanently assigned and not supplement, not, not supplement 
the general fund allocation to the police department that it be over and above the amount of money allocated to the police department budget on an annual basis. Because otherwise then there is no additional money that would be provided for the extra training, the extra educational programs, the extra outreach, et cetera. And um, it would just be you know, used in the regular course of the day. And I, I think we've missed the opportunity to really uh, benefit from the tax in order to truly educate the community about the um, drug recognition and the education and prevention programs. Councillor Dickey. Thank you, so just to clarify, um, so the, right now the any um, alcohol or tobacco tax we get, all of it goes to law enforcement, is that? Correct, or are, is that's other my understanding. I think Kelly Jacobs is standing it's up to come to the microphone. Th those those proceeds are currently budgeted in the police department budget. Yes. Only they don't go to any other departments of the city. Right now, in the revenue section of the general fund budget, in the source of funds section, the uh, the state shared revenues, for instance, the alcohol tax, cigarette, nine one one. All of the alcohol are allocated, all of the alcohol related are allocated to the police department. A proportionate share of 911 is allocated to the police department. A proportionate share of 911 is allocated to the fire department. The cigarette tax, which is estimated in the next year's budget to be about $211,000, is considered unrestricted. And so it is, it is part of the, just like all of these revenues are just part of the general fund. But we allocate, actually we designate um, in the source of funds, the revenues to the police department. The majority of the state shared. So, just make a comment. So, um, just thinking this through right now, because we just have just started discussing this portion of it. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, and, and I think, I, I completely support um, additional funds going to the police department. I completely support having it be a separate completely separate thing so it doesn't get swallowed up in the general fund and, or into their general um, budget. I'm wondering because we don't know exactly what how much that's going to be. We've had that discussion. We don't know what the taxes are going to look like. We don't know. Is it going to be $20,000 a year? Is it going to be $2 million a year? Something in between. We really don't know that. My my gut says, you know, it'd be great to have allocate a percentage like 60%, 75%. I don't know what that number looks like and still and then anything over and above that is available to be used for other purposes. So, but not knowing how how much it's going to be that kind of makes me <coughs> wonder how best to allocate it. Okay. Thank you. Good points. Uh Councilor Anderson and then I believe Councilor Bednarz and and uh Councilor Nanke. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Kelly, could you get back to the podium, please? Uh, thank you. Um, the way the alcohol and, and cigarette and other monies you've discussed is allocated, is that as a result of a council policy or is that just kind of a staff decision to, to assign that money to the police department? It's been our practice. Okay. So and especially around the alcohol, we have to designate through uh, our a resolution process with the state how the money should be spent. So then when that money goes to the police department, there's really no restrictions on how the police department can use that money. It's just allocated to them. It's another part of their budget. It, it's, it's just uh, part of a revenue right, source right, or a revenue stream right. that allows them to function. Right, right. Yes. So they can use that for, uh, the police department uses that any way it needs to, which might include these alcohol, tobacco programs that might also include money for you know another downtown policeman that sort of stuff it's just we have designated patrol services generally speaking right right you know so having heard that i'm not so sure that i, I agree that it would be a good idea to put this to the police department but I, I don't know if I want to tell the police department how they should spend that money um, in, in what they do I mean that's kind of to me is we're getting down to pretty much micromanaging there and you know that's why we have an excellent police department because they're the ones who best determine and I, I also note that much of the stuff 
you know, I mean, I, uh, the, the chief was talking about is already being done. I mean, we're looking at a substance which is now totally illegal, except for the medical part of it, or was totally illegal, and now it's a, it's a legal substance. So I don't know that there would be any more or less uh, uh, enforcement uh, or uh, education than is already being done. So I'm in favor of giving it to the police department, uh, but not to tell the police department how they ought to spend the money. Um, I also think in some sense we're getting a little bit ahead of, ahead of this because the issue here, because we won't know until November whether or not we're even going to have this money. Right, and, and I, I believe, uh, Councillor Anderson, that you're earnest in your comments, and, and I take those seriously. Uh, I, from what I've read and, and heard, there will be an increase in the amount of enforcement work and the amount of prevention uh, and education work that's going to come about because with the legalization of recreational marijuana, there's going to be a greater use of recreational marijuana in the community. And there's no doubt about that, and that's certainly been uh, found in the, uh, the states where it's been legalized. My concern is, and I've, I've seen this happen in the past, when budgets need to be restricted and need to be reduced, often the thing that is reduced is the training time. We've, know, we've seen that with our police department, we've seen that in the fire department, and in fact we've seen it across, across the city. Uh, training and professional development for everyone and I, I think it's particularly important for the police department to know that in, in good times and bad times they're going to have the money for the training and the education and the outreach that's needed particularly to deal with, um, with the uh, outfall of the use of marijuana. I don't have a strong desire about restricting it if the police department wanted to use that with all drug recognition and all drug in, uh, enforcement and all drug uh, prevention and education. But I would not like to see that money simply supplant the other parts of the budget so that it makes no difference to the equation and yet they're having to work harder to do more because of new laws and new rules and, and new processes in the community. I saw some other hands. Councillor Bennett, or excuse me, Councillor Bednars, Councillor Benjamin, Councillor Nankey. So I noticed the same thing in the okay. explanatory statement that was provided to us by staff. It said they're expecting revenues to be about $100,000 per year. And uh, no, no, it was 100,000 earmarked for the first, for the second period of 2016 17, it's the 2017 when it goes into effect Matt, in January. If that's what Madam I Mayor, understood I, this I, morning. I, that's what I did tell you this morning, I was incorrect. The $100,000 is an annual estimate. Oh, that's the annual estimate, okay. It is, you're Sorry. right, it's not clear. I just took it as 100,000 okay. per year. In the very next sentence, it was talking about there are no restrictions on how the city may uh, use these uh, revenues that are generated by the tax. Right. And I, I'm in support. I, I think what we were told in, in the learning curve that we had about uh, both medical and recreational marijuana is that there's no uh, breathalyzer that you can do like with alcohol. Uh, you've got to get the training in the officers in order to identify an impaired driver with marijuana in them, and that's that's education, and, and you know that's going to be a continuous thing as we we do go through officers, and right. and I could see this this very much. I don't want to get down on the weeds because there are other drugs coming up, and this may not become a big one. So I would say the same thing: dedicate it towards with the intent of using it for in addition to the uh, normal budget that the um, that the, uh, the police get to help in, in drug enforcement but not specifically where we're going to get down into the weeds with mandating that they do it that way. I'd be good with that. Let's see, whose hand was it? Councillor Benjamin. I certainly understand the sentiment of, of uh, fortifying police budget for drug outreach programs and an increased potential patrols and whatnot. Uh, that's going to be very helpful going forward, but to actually tie the full amount because we're not really sure exactly what that number is mm -hmm. going to be, um, seems like we're going to be tying ourselves up for future uh, uses going forward. So what if uh, whatever goes forward to the police department and the drug recognition program, people just, you know what, stop using marijuana, you know, <laughs> or, or not use it as much, if you will. Um, well, then that, that revenue source kind of, kind of dries up. But I like the idea that if it does go bigger than expected, well, then you have a, lops, a very large chunk of money that's under the police purview, not that they couldn't spend it. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. But you know, we have other things that, that that could go forward to help combat against that, like the park system, the transit system, mm -hmm. homeless, mm -hmm. all those kind of things that we we all care about. Um, if that revenue stream is bigger than what really is needed to go forward with the police department, just uh, just don't want to tie it up. Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you. I think that's a good point, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, I wondered I'm so if. I'm sorry. Councillor Nankey has had his hand up for quite a while. I'm well, so sorry. Well, he just sorry better keep. He Did just got to wave a lot yeah. harder. <laughs> I don't know if there's a blind spot right here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the state taxes on recreational marijuana actually do have some stipulations on them where they have to be spent as well. And I know that the uh, city manager in Ashland is really concerned about that because he has zero issues apparently with any of his dispensaries and is at a loss to figure out how to spend his money. Hmm. But uh, that being said, will we have a, uh, an equivalent public hearing on state shared revenues with marijuana similar to what we do with the other state shared revenues then? I actually have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I've not heard anything about a public hearing where we actually have to designate the use of the funds. Okay. I don't know at this time. <laughs> All right, thanks. I, I do support you know it being uh, moved into the budget category of to where most of the, the need will be, it being uh, supplanted or not. I mean, it's all part of general fund income. We just take that portion towards police. The, uh, the amount of money the police department gets is enormous. Um, so it's enormous, but it's it never is enormous. enough. <laughs> and, and so we budget appropriately to what they need right. to, to do their job. But I think it, it makes more sense to direct it towards that because it gives it a, a nexus. But does that prevent any other general fund monies from, I, th I think we look at police operations wholly and, and, and budget based on general fund dollars and shared, shared revenue dollars. Um, so your point is, your conclusion is? <laughs> we can, we can put it there. It, it makes sense. But does it make a lot of difference overall in the budgeting process? Probably not. Um, if we actually try to restrict it to a, a small portion of the budget, I think it, if nothing else, it just makes it more difficult for staff to then track the break apart between the two rather than just saying we'll give it to the police department for um, operations. Well, interesting that you just said that because I had already written a note to myself and my question was can we track how those funds are used? Yes. And if we can't track how those funds are used, then I think we're not fulfilling if, if indeed this council will support this, this concept, the only way that we would know that the money is used effectively as if it can be tracked. Which has That a means it has to be a designated fund. Yeah. Councillor Bennett, do you have thoughts about I, that? I did, Madam Mayor. I, one of the uh, things I think I'd like to understand better is what the, the magnitude of the issue looks like. And mm -hmm. I wondered if uh, we could have Margo come up, if you'd allow it to have Margo come up and maybe give us just a quick, what's the first year look like from the perspective of people who are in the business right now? In I'm terms not of how sure much money. That that's part of this discussion. That well, may be a different segment of the issue. Th I think maybe the if if the if the issue is a hundred thousand or if it's a half million, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. magnitude of what we're mm -hmm. talking about changes it kind of. How much education can you do? Do, do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's like are we mm -hmm. are we dealing with a much larger amount of money coming in than we're forecasting right, right. now? That's what I'd like to understand is what's coming right. at us kind right. of. And I recognize that we we don't know tonight and we won't know right away. And I thought that Councillor Dickey and Councillor Benjamin had a good point in that perhaps we could make a percentage uh, okay. for for that and I'm I'm cognizant of the fact that yes we're sort of ahead of the ahead of the issue or sure. ahead of the decisions and yet at the same time I was told by our city attorney that if we don't enact this correct me if I'm wrong city attorney but if we don't enact this correctly then we would have to come back later and change the ordinance and everything else so that's why I wanted to be sure tonight that we had this discussion and that we 
get this kind of on the right track if indeed the council will will support this concept and I'm, i don't have any problem with the concept madam mayor at all uh but i'll tell you the the thing that concerns me is that we understand we're probably talking about a four hundred thousand dollar issue the first year that this is we're talking actually going to be a pretty substantial amount of money this is my understanding mm -hmm. and that we only marked it at a hundred just means we didn't catch how much is really happening out there. This is my impression of what's going on out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm a little, that's all. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm pleased to hear yeah. you're looking yeah. at the percentages maybe as the way to go or mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Because if this is going to be a, a, a large influx of, of revenue to the city, we probably can't absorb it in just education and training. We may have to have it for patrols and mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And cars right. and right. radios and other right. stuff. So right. that's, all, that's all I'm concerned about. Right, but if indeed the work of law enforcement Decreases. increases because of recreational, the legalization of recreational oh, yeah. marijuana, then the money that funds that department has got to increase, yes. not just be supplanted by right. No, I agree money. with you on that, okay. Mayor. I'm just I, the only thing I okay. worry about is is uh, if uh, it's trying to tell him what we he would do specifically with the money in terms of program, but allow him to kind of respond, you know, with training, education, patrol, mm -hmm. uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. y do you know what I mean? I do he, know, he's and able I do agree. I, I agree what you're saying because we don't want to get down. We've talked about this at the yeah. budget committee. We don't want to get down to the point where we're telling the department heads how they're supposed to run their department. So okay. I know there are a lot of hands up. Uh, Councillor McCoy and then Councillor Anderson and Councillor Bednarz and Councillor Benjamin. Okay, um, I haven't weighed in, so I guess I will now. I, I'm in favor of the money going to the police department. That to me is a logical extension of what's going on. That's it. I mean, when we start trying to earmark it or how much is going to go where, I, we're getting, I mean, why would we want to track, you know, if they've got $30 million, we don't track all $30 million where it's going. We know we get a budget, so here's where the money's mm -hmm. going to get spent. Mm -hmm. We're adding to their amount of money for them to do their responsibilities, and an added responsibility is going to be, uh, you know, overseeing these mm -hmm. mar uh, recreational marijuana sales and, and subsequent problems if they pop up, just like a lot, a lot of the things they do. So to try to earmark it or track it or do anything else, um, I don't think. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but giving them the money does. So okay. I'll support the motion, but I'm not real supportive of getting way down in the weeds any farther than we are. Okay, thank you. Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I agree with what Councilor McCoy just said, but I have a further question for the city attorney. Assuming we pass the resolution as it is before us tonight, or I guess it's a resolution, whatever the action we're supposed mm -hmm. to take. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. it is resolution. Mm -hmm. Could we then, and then assuming that the public votes in favor of the tax in November, at that point, um, we're basically, we've already said the money's going to the general fund, so as the city, we'd be free to, to if we wanted to, to designate that. I don't think we want to, but except to the extent that it goes to the police department, we would still be keeping faith with the voters for the way the resolution and the ballot measure is now worded. It, we're just saying it's going to the general fund. If it goes to the general fund, that's the budgetary and city council process, next budget cycle as to how we, how we use that money. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's all I needed to know, thank you. But Councilor Anderson, my point is that I yeah. would recommend that it be in addition to the budgeted money that comes from the general fund, not supplant money from the general fund. Well, and that and I, that I, I and there point, is a Mayor, difference. There is I think a difference. That becomes a, a budgetary issue in the next budget cycle and becomes a council issue of the priorities. Yeah. No. And we also don't, you know, we don't know or is, are we talking 100,000 or 400,000 and I think that we'll know better by the end of this year in November is when the, um, you know, the election is held and I don't know, Dan, that it comes effective in January, I would presume. 
correct. They haven't started licensing retail yeah. outlets yet. They're not so going to do that. So we'll have, by that point, we'll have a whole year of experience pretty much. As to, then we'll have a good idea of how much money we're talking about. And at that point, we can discuss the issues the mayor is talking about. We don't just want to say, well, we got $100,000, so we're going to reduce the police department budget by $100,000 because we're giving them this $100,000. Well, that's exactly my concern, and yeah. that's why I'm bringing this forward, because if we don't have this specified, as I understood it in our meeting this morning, if we don't have this specified to be in addition to the budget, mm -hmm. then it won't be, and that will be it. We will have lost this opportunity. Yeah. This isn't something... If I understood correctly this morning, this isn't something that we can go back in and do later. And I'm concerned this is the time to address it because this is the time when all of this um, paperwork and the resolution is going forward. I think, I think the, the key to this discussion, and the city attorney can, can correct me, I think the key to this discussion is what you choose to include in the explanatory statement. Right. The, the, the resolution refers to the ordinance, and the ordinance refers to the explanatory statement as Exhibit B. So I think that the clarity of, of the council policy intent regarding the use of the proceeds uh, is, is within the explanatory statement. I, the, the explanatory statement needs to be consistent with the ordinance. So if you want to direct that these funds only be used for police activities or whatnot, it, the ordinance needs to be amended to do that. Okay. Now you can you can go ahead and pass the resolution tonight and then uh, we have until September to withdraw the, re the ballot title from elections and replace it. Um, or you can just with hold off on doing anything with the resolution tonight, change the ordinance, and then we'll come back with a new explanatory statement and measure. Wouldn't we be able to go ahead tonight and make all of these decisions and you can't take final action because you don't have an ordinance in front of you that proposes this amendment right but we can make a we can make a recommendation tonight can we not that would allow us that would direct you to draft the ordinance and the ballot title so that it includes that wording correct okay that's what i want to achieve this evening uh count let's see where were we who was left councillor Benjamin, Councillor Bednars, and then Councillor Lewis. Well, like I, like I said before, it's, as it's worded now is great because that gives an opportunity going forward to see what kind of revenues come in. And then during the budget cycle has a full line item. This is how much came in. And then this council can make a decision. Great. That was $100,000. Let's add that supplement to the city's the police budget that i don't see that as being an issue if it comes in being you know three quarters of a million dollars and we've already set the ordinance up that all of that goes into the police mm -hmm. department i think that's a mistake mm -hmm. um uh, going forward i like the idea how it's worded now but just just understanding with this council moving forward is that hey you know that money up front is for police okay to add to the budget like you like mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i just want i don't want to hamstring it and lock it into just just for police because mm -hmm. who knows where that goes after that it comes out to be two million dollars somewhere down the road well let me ask a point of order then uh, or a point of process are we able to specify a percentage at a later time absolutely so it, you know it, after the uh, if the if it gets referred to the voters and the voters approve it, you can always come back and amend the ordinance. We can do that, eh? No. <laughs> the voters have to approve it, but yes, you can do it at any point. Yes, yes, that's what I said. We'd have to go out to the voters again. No, no. What do you say? What do you say? So, uh, a, a law that's been referred by the, the governing body to the people, you can amend that at any point in the future. That's not a problem. Are you saying that we would be able to come back and then prescribe a percentage to the police department in, in addition to their regular budget and the rest would go to the general fund? Yes. Okay. And when would we do that? After the, after the ordinance is approved by the voters. 
and that's on the it will be on the ballot in November. That's correct. So then it would come back back to this council when. The election results, maybe the city recorder can help me out, but they probably wouldn't be certified until January. I mean, she's nodding yes. So. It's about when we see us after ballots as well. So at some point in the in 2017, once the election results are certified, it's then the law, and then you can change the law. Would we be able to make that specification this evening that the tax revenue would be directed solely to the police department and be able to review that decision as to the percentage in, um, in an, a separate decision, but that decision would still be guided by the discussion this evening? If we decide that a percentage to the police department and the rest to the general fund, As it's currently stated, the, the money would just go to the general fund. If you wanted to require that all or a portion of the tax revenue go to the Salem Police Department, you would need to amend the ordinance to do that. And the explanatory statement, which is part of the measure, has to be consistent with the ordinance. So you wouldn't adopt the resolution tonight. You would, you would defer action on that, table that issue direct staff to amend the ordinance, you'd come back and adopt the new ordinance and then you'd adopt a new ballot measure based on that new ordinance. All right. Thank you. All right, has uh, Councilor, ben Councilor Bednards and then Councilor Lewis. So the, the uh, explanatory uh, statement is something I think that you ended up writing? That's correct. And so where did you get the, must go to you, where did you get the $100,000 annual yeah, where'd that come from? It's based on discussions with uh, the City of Salem's Finance Division. Okay. And I, I mean, I find we're, to me, it's a little bit of splitting hairs because I do see where the money needs to go to the police department for the funding of some of the things that this new drugs are in, into our community is bringing problems. But on the other side of that is, is that if it turns out to be $500,000, as Councilman Bennett had, had said, uh, you could always lower the amount that comes out of the general fund for the remainder if you really felt like, hey, we, we, and we do, we have a lot of needs for money, money in this community, mm -hmm. in, in this mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. So you could always lower uh, another end mm -hmm. from the general fund and it wouldn't be anything worse. Um, I do find it funny that uh, we're funding police with drug money, but <laughs> hey. that's my comment. I'm just saying that you could always drop it at the other end if you really mm -hmm. find that it's a huge <clears throat> amount of money. But at this point, I think we're just splitting hairs. Yeah. Councilor Lewis. Okay, I think I've heard enough. Um, and last time I checked, <laughs> alcohol is a drug, so they're already funding the police with drug money. <laughs> and successfully, I hope. Um, my sense is, and this is where I'd want to know if we have the flexibility um, or if uh, amending ordinances is really an elaborate process. But I, can, I agree with what the consensus is here tonight for the upcoming year. But after a year's worth of experience, we'll have more of an idea of what the exact amount is. I, I want to make the decision about tomorrow when I have the information that'll help me make that decision tomorrow. So what we're talking about tonight is fine for the next year or year and a half, whatever. But I just want to hear if, this, if the city council has the flexibility to after it gets this information, change the ordinance, whether it be to a percentage or whatever. Um, if that's the case, then, then I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, Councilor Benjamin, did you, did I miss you? I'm pretty much done. I just wanna wrap my head a little bit more around this. As, mm -hmm. the, as it's written now, it's just going forward saying to the voters, 3% goes into the general fund, mm -hmm. there it goes. Mm -hmm. Later on, we can make decisions on where that money goes, how much goes to, because there's, there's not gonna, we're gonna have to not change anything through the, through the ordinance going forward. It's just a budgetary line item that we, you know, the police needs an additional, we have the marijuana revenues here next year, 200,000, so let's put all 200,000 to supplement and add to the police budget. 
The year after that, in the general fund, marijuana comes up to be 500,000. Well, let's just do another 200,000. That other 300,000, we can make decisions as a council moving forward, where can we better spend that money without having to go back and change an ordinance. Am I correct in understanding that? That's correct. Okay, so it's fine but, the way it's written. But if I'm understanding this correctly, Councillor Benjamin, if we don't make this specification now uh -huh. that it goes to the police department, it will go to the general fund. And the general fund then, the city manager uh -huh. allocates across the city, uh -huh. and that specificity will not be governing that action. And that's what I'm concerned but about. But the council can come back uh, every budget cycle and say, we're going to allot X amount of money. As we know, when we're in the budgeting process, mm -hmm. the money isn't in a bottom drawer. It's mm -hmm. already been spread around. Right. And so then if we came back and said, oh, we'd like to have $100,000 allocated to the police department to specifically deal with the drug recognition and drug education and prevention programs, we may be told, no, the money's already been distributed across the needs of the city mm -hmm. and the money isn't there. Or we'll be told, well, you have to cut something else. What mm -hmm. are you going to cut? I don't okay. want I this council to be in that position. Okay, I, I don't want the budget committee to be in that position. I want that money to be identified and clearly understood that it would go to the police department in addition to the general fund allocation to the police department. That's what we've been talking about. That's my goal this mm -hmm. evening. Yes. I, if I may, uh, certainly this discussion, uh, the chief and deputy city manager are, are, are and certainly I am hearing uh, the discussion and the sense of council. And, and certainly if, if the chief were to come to me and say we need funding for uh, some dedicated education to uh, supplement our DARE program to do something related uh, to the use of, of recreational marijuana, you would see that reflected in the proposed budget or in some other uh, policy uh, recommendation uh, for you. I can't tell you when that might occur. Uh, however, certainly uh, the chief, the deputy city manager, and I are, are hearing uh, the, the sense of counsel regarding these funds should be available to the police department to help offset or prevent the impacts of, of the increased use of, the potential increased use of, of recreational marijuana. Well, I just see that there's such a wide gap between the word available to and specified for. And that's, that's my concern. Available to is totally discretionary. Specified for is very directive. And I saw someone's hand up. So are you saying 100% of well, I, I'm to right to the police? Well, I'm saying that if there is a greater amount of money of revenue than would be required for that type of education and drug recognition training and uh, education and prevention, then certainly, I mean, we're if. If it comes to a half a million dollars, or any reasonable person would probably say, all right, let's look at a percentage, but, but you're we saying don't put know it in tonight. Law now, though. But I'm sorry? You're saying put it into the, the ordinance now, though, the, the Put readings. it into the ordinance now that it would be specified. It's really just like the, the alcohol and tobacco tax money. That is but we don't specified. Specify That's specified to law enforcement. I'm just trying to do the same thing and make these equal. Yes, I mean, we don't know what the tax might be for alcohol and, and tobacco, but we're not nervous about not allocating it. We allocate it, all of it. Hands up over here, Councillor McCoy. Okay, we're getting far afield from the resolution, but what we really have here is either we pass this resolution and fix the ordinance later, or we don't pass this resolution we change the ordinance, and then we pass a new resolution to get it on the ballot. Right. Yeah, is that right? Explicit. Yes, that is, two. that is correct. So we're now to the point, what do we want to do? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I think to some degree, Madam Mayor, I agree where the money should go. Um, I also don't think that the city staff is going to 
abscond that money and put it somewhere else if that's the wish of the major. But if, if truly that's, if we want to have it go to the police, I think then we've got to not pass this resolution and move ahead on the money. But let's do something here because we're talking circles right now. So Correct. do I need, what kind of a motion do we okay. need to say? To defer action to on defer the resolution action. to bring back an ordinance with specific language. Well. Councilor Nanke, would you say that again, please? And what essentially the said. city attorney mentioned earlier, if we want to go that direction, we need to defer action on the resolution, give staff direction to bring back an ordinance incorporating specific language. All right. I would like some assistance on what this specific language is supposed well, to say. Correct. Well, correct. Which I would be to you. the, and I think that's kind of where everybody's going around right now. And until we see what that vote for the specific language is, there's um, diversity on whether or not it should go to law enforcement or become uh, more uh, targeted inside of law enforcement to the training and recognition pieces. Right, Councillor Anderson and then Councillor. I'm of the mindset sorry. that it goes straight to law enforcement like the shared revenue do yeah. currently. And that's what staff, when they look at and they're budgeting, yeah. they don't say, oh, okay, we'll budget for the police department. And oh, by the way, we have these shared revenues come in. It's part of the overall budget. Um, and to, to force staff to look at this extra piece after the fact and or track it is essentially adding more administration over on the top, which is taking money away from cops on the street, yeah. um, which is where we want it. Well, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Councillor Anderson and then Councillor Bennett. We, we've got a motion on the floor and nobody's moved to amend or table or postpone. So unless we hear somebody make that kind of motion, I think we ought to vote on the motion. Well, you're going to hear front. something. Okay, okay. well, good. All Let's right. do it. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. You go ahead. Councillor Bennett. No, go ahead. What were you going to say? You were going to do that Bennett? motion? I just want to get this. I want to get a motion on. All right. The would you, would you pre no. All right. Let's hear your motion. Okay. I move we amend uh, the uh, motion to... Uh, uh, instruct the city Councilor attorney. Councilor Bennett, can I suggest you make a substitute motion? Oh, gosh. Yeah. You want a substitute motion? Yeah. I move that we uh, 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 amend the ordinance to uh, dedicate proceeds from the 3% marijuana tax to law enforcement, to, to the police department, and that that be reflected in the uh, ballot explanation and, and we defer consideration and of the resolution and defer, well yeah we defer consideration tonight you need some time to write it up okay okay it's been moved by councillor bennett and seconded by councillor bednars and is there discussion councillor dickey thank you i just need some clarification um provided this comes back to us this passes this comes back to us when we say we are dedicating that 3% to the police department, I, I share your concern, Mayor, um, with whatever amount we would dedicate to the police. And, and I, don't, I don't want to put it in a box to say you're gonna use it for education, or you're gonna use it for something. But I think, as you know, we talked about, if our police, if we have a $30 million budget and we get $200,000 based on this, then the police budget then becomes 30 million plus $200,000, not, 30 million and $200,000 going to somewhere else and this is supplementing what would already be and I think that's what you've been that's trying to I'm say trying all to night say. Thank and you. so I don't know if there's a way to sort of um, I I just want to know that that's what would happen so this money is it's not it's not dedicated in that it's a line item saying this is what you're going to buy curriculum with but dedicated then it it w whatever it is increases the budget by that amount as opposed to going into it so Thank I just you. I'd like to know that that is what this means right that's my goal yes. Councilor Bennett did you have your well that isn't what this motion would do <laughs> just in case just so it wasn't unclear I'm fine I mean you can make it I I just don't want to keep amending this I just wanted to get to a vote but uh, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to say that it is uh, uh, this d represents a non uh, non-fungible or non-supplemented revenue source, however you want to describe it. It's, it goes in on top of any other budgeting. The problem with that is it is so difficult in a, in a budget cycle to 
deal with what's really happened when the budget's put together that it, I think you have to at some point just trust the goodwill of management to understand what we have suggested here. Because you can do it. I've watched it done over the years in other, in other budget areas uh, where you can't see the 200,000 bucks that disappeared, but it did. You know what I mean? I, I think you just have to, at some, at some point, this is goodwill. But mm -hmm. if you want to say it, I'm, I have no problem saying it. I, I think okay. that'd be fine. That's what, that's what I would it. prefer. OK. All right. So is your <laughs> motion then, are you going to amend your motion? Will you amend your motion? You're saying no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's just say, uh, let's, let's do an amendment that All says right. the money uh, cannot be supplemented that comes on top of the budget and, and however whatever that sounds like let's vote on that amendment so we can get back to the other amendment because clearly there's a difference of opinion let's find out where everybody is on that all right so the motion then is on the floor I'm sorry is there a second to, the there a second oh, to second. your second. amendment and <laughs> Councillor Bednars is seconding the amendment so the amendment the amended motion by Councillor B Bennett is to treat the revenue generated from the tax on recreational marijuana as an addition to the budget appropriated from the general fund for the police department. That's correct. Okay. All right, that's the motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Councillor Nanke. Yeah, I'll be voting against that because after the first year, it's, it's impossible to see inside of a budget cycle. Um, you look at $30 million, it's, it's all over the place based on what the police department needs this year or that year, so you will lose any traceability of that. And it, I, I'm not going to support the, motion. the amendment. I don't see why you have to lose track of it if it's held separately and no, then added not, to. Why not? I, I, I fail to understand your point. Can I, for just a second? So the city manager is going to prepare the budget for 1718. Mm -hmm. He is going to totally not even consider that there's $400,000 and budget everything, and then at the end come back in and say, OK, here's 400000 for this piece. That, that doesn't make sense. They look at all the revenue that comes in. They don't look at the shared revenue for alcohol any different. It's part of our revenue in. We know what the police department needs. It's, it's nice for the public hearing requirement from the state to say, we're directing it towards law enforcement. Other than that, you really can't put it in like a little block somewhere. Would that be an accurate statement from budgetary folk? Yeah, yes, it, it, it is possible. We, we, we do have uh, federal grants. There are some revenue sources where we have to account, uh, but generally how you described it is, is, is how we approach budgeting. Councillor Lewis. Uh, sorry, I can't uh, support the motion as the way I understand it. You are now forcing the staff to keep those funds separate and go to the police department no matter what, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that elimination of the flexibility is just not good for the city. Mm -hmm. All right. Spoke. All right. So the motion <laughs> on the floor is that the money is that the what I just said, that the revenue would be held separately and added in. All right, so that's the motion on the floor. It's the amendment. That's it's the amendment. The amendment that's the, 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 the amendment right. to the substitute motion. Thank you. And I do appreciate everyone's perseverance with this, believe me. All right, so the motion on the floor. All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. Would the nays please raise your hands? All right, that was the Councillor Lewis, Bednars, Benjamin, Anderson, and McCoy, and Nanke. Motion fails. All right, now we're back to, to the, the other original one. motion, which well, is substitute, substitute motion. Substitute motion. Yeah. I'm sorry, to substitute motion, which is to dedicate uh, the, the funds 
generated by the 3% tax on recreational marijuana to law enforcement. As in, right. as in police. All right. <laughs> yeah, and they're directing to modify the arts all together. All right, it's been, okay, the motion by Councillor Bennett is to, to dedicate the funds received from the revenue, the revenue from the tax on recreational marijuana would be dedicated Excuse me, would, what is the correct word then? Allocated? Al allocated to the, the police department. Thank you, allocated to the police department. <coughs> and it was motion. moved by, and then the resolution has to be. And you'll table the resolution. Advised. And table re the resolution. Correct, that was the other part of the motion, different resolution. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we're Staff making, brings back the we're ordinance making with sausage the language. here, but I just got a thumbs up from yeah, Councillor right Bennett, so I think we're okay. I think we, we just okay. made it. All right, so that was the motion by Councillor Bennett, and all right, uh, Councillor Anderson, and then Councillor Lewis, and then Councillor Bednars. I do want to make sure there was a second on that motion yeah, from Councillor Bednars. Oh, thank you, all right. <laughs> Councillor Lewis, and then Councillor Anderson. Well, I will support this motion, um, and it's maybe been a half hour no ago, but um, the city manager made it crystal clear that the only way to make his job easier is to have a good inclination of what this body wants to do, and then he can say, well, you told me to. So I believe that they will and are listening, yep. okay. and they know very well how to spend that first dollar and the second. And as we find out, again, what it's gonna end up being, we'll probably make other decisions. Yeah. But for right now, this motion is good for me. Yeah. Councilor Anderson. I'm gonna vote against the substitute motion because I heard the budget officer say, we already do this with the, the other funds we have from the other you know, I, 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 I'm not adopting this phrase, but I'll just say the other sin taxes that, 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 that come into the city, and we already do that as a matter of policy, so I, 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 I think the, count, the, the staff is already doing the right thing and will do the right thing on this, and I don't want to, I think this is just another area that we could potentially hamstring. Councilor Anderson, I don't think that's what the budget officer said. The, the revenue that we receive from alcohol and tobacco tax, there, it is prescribed to go to law enforcement. Is that not correct? The alcohol and tobacco tax. She's nodding her head. It is prescribed to law enforcement. The, right now, the way this is written, there will be no prescription beyond it goes into the general fund. Okay. tobacco. I'm sorry? Tobacco goes directly into the general fund currently. Only the alcohol goes towards law enforcement. Okay, and thank you for that clarification. Is that? And that's what? That's right, okay. All right. So the substitute motion on the floor. We don't need to do one of those. We know what it is, right? I don't think we can do it again. We know what it is? Do you know what it is? Yeah. All right. I know what it was. We're ready for the question on the substitute motion, which is to allocate the revenue from the sale of recreational marijuana to law enforcement. Correct? And that's what's yes. and made by the consideration of the resolution. And right. for the the approval of the rec of the resolution, right? All right. We'll vote on that. All those in favor of the motion as presented by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Bednars. Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And Councilor Anderson registers the nay vote. Thank you, everyone, for your patience and your your um, participation. Frankly, I thought it was a good discussion. All right. There are information items, information reports in your packet. Yes, Councillor Anderson. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. I'd like to speak to item number 6A. I, I just want to say that um, the First Church of Christ or the Christian Scientist Church has been an extremely good neighbor to SCAN Neighborhood Group, and they've been also a good neighbor to the individual neighbors who surround whose property and homes surround that particular church. And 
Uh, I'm in favor of this, and, and I think it's a good idea, and I, that's why I, I don't want to call it up or anything, just, just to say that uh, this is an appropriate thing to do, and uh, the church is to be commended for their outreach to the neighbors. Great. Thank you. I was wanting to talk to you about that and find out if that was indeed well, the case, so know. thank you. I yeah. appreciate that because uh, that had been my my understanding, but it's uh, very helpful always to hear from the yeah. council Madam Mayor, I, the I've ward. had several conversations with specific neighbors whose property abuts, and they're they've been nothing but complimentary about the way the city's handled this and about the way the church has approached them too great wonderful thank you all right any other comments on uh, information reports we have no ordinance uh, this evening and is there anyone signed up for public comment we have one person signed up for public comment marvin sandez are you here Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. All right. Please join us. You have three minutes at the end of two minutes. The amber light comes on at the end of three uh, minutes. Well, the I, red light comes on. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm Marvin Sanis. I, I'm at 640 15th Street Northeast. Uh, this discussion of homelessness, I want to get some of these numbers in front of my city council. This chart is 20 years of poppy planning in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It's a $60 billion criminal enterprise worldwide. Uh, and how this relates to the homelessness in Salem, which it, as you know is epidemic. The, three weeks ago the statesman had almost 1,000 public school kids. There's a direct correlation to what we are doing in Afghanistan and this homelessness problem we have in our community. As you can see, in 2001, the Taliban had the planning down to 8,000 hectares. A hectare is about three acres. The record crop in 2014. Now, to put this in, in 2001, a gram of heroin at North Salem High School cost $400. This morning, a gram of heroin at North Salem High School is $100, or $80 if you're a regular buyer. And they all become regular buyers. We have an epidemic. We have an epidemic in Salem. That is under the radar. These guys know about it. And those people that were here before, the shelter, the women's shelter, they know about the heroin epidemic. These children, the school bus drivers, know about the heroin epidemic. These kids coming out of the bushes to get on a bus to go to school to get something to eat. If you're addicted to heroin and you're a young mother or a young father, you gotta pay 100 and 160 bucks a day. When a 15 year old starts with heroin addiction, a gram of heroin will last her about three days, her first year. By the time she's a senior, a gram of heroin will last uh, a day. By the time she's a young mother with two kids, 24 years old, a gram of heroin lasts her uh, half a day. Well, a dad and a mom that are spending 160 bucks each for the, uh, and addiction is a medical condition. It's a medical condition that has to be treated medically. Uh, so anyway, these numbers are, and we have to address this. We have to look at what we're doing. We keep this thing, uh, we don't want to talk about it because it is painful. We are in our 15th year at war with a country that still uses horses and carts for farming. We've got to face this, this horrible thing we're doing, not only to those people, but to our own children. This is insane, and we've got to face it. So anyway, I'm very glad to hear you guys talking about this homelessness task Thank you. force. We and I'm going to be here your, Wednesday your at testimony. 6 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Lewis. You know, I, 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 I think you're preaching to the choir, but I'm, I'm a little confused about the graph. So are you saying that there's increase in cultivation because of something the United States is doing? Absolutely. That is beyond question. This graph is from the United Nations Office of Drugs, UNODC, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. So, but I, I again, I don't think there's any 
any American citizens over there planting and cultivating the crop. So your, your proof is the crop's up, the addictions are up. Right? <laughs> Crops up, the market is flooded. There's a criminal enterprise going on worldwide. Let me tell you about the 2015 Excuse graph. me, I well, am going to draw you know, this to a close yeah, because I have you've that, had your three minutes. And if, Councillor Lewis, do you have a specific question? I have one, question? yeah, a real simple question, at least in my mind. What would you want us, not the City Council of Salem, because I'm not going there, what would you want the United States to do about it? We have to get, we have to get out of the, the Afghanistan. Yeah. You think okay. that's okay? Thank you. I am going to draw this to a close because it sort of becomes cyclical. But thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. All right, we have one more item on the agenda this evening, and that's a mayor's motion. You will find that in the additions to this evening's uh, agenda. <laughs> And my motion is that I move that council reschedule council's June 13th regularly meeting to June 6th and schedule a public hearing for June 8th regarding the future police facility. And then you read in the discussion on that motion. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councilor Dickey, for your second. So several members of our council will not be available on June 13th at the council meeting and so my motion is to move the council meeting to June 6th, and that will allow greater participation by the members of the council. And at that evening, we will be discussing the, uh, adopting the city's fiscal year 2016-17 budget. And that, I have to stop and read this myself twice over to be sure that I'm saying this correctly. On the June 13th council meeting, we will be, dis be discussing the June, excuse me, discussing the fiscal year budget 2016-17 and adopting that budget. And there'll be no regular meeting on June 13th. Correct. And then on June 8th, a public hearing on the police facility will be held and that allows council the time to direct staff to prepare the ballot <coughs> title for consideration for the June 27th council meeting. Got it? Okay, so that's the motion by me and uh, seconded by Councillor Dickey. Is there any discussion about the motion? Councillor Bednars. Just curious, you had June yes. 8th, which is a Wednesday night. It's unusual, normally we hold the public hearings with in, in concert with one of our council meetings? We have held, for instance, we did hold a public hearing on the location for the police facility on a night separate of a council meeting, and we are allowed to do that under council rules. As long as we've given notice, I see nothing wrong with it. I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, so the motion is to reschedule the June 13th meeting to June 6th and the public hearing for June 8th. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. All right, the nays raise your hands, please. Councillor Anderson, Councillor Nanke. Was that it? Yeah, we'll both miss neighborhood association meetings. Yeah. All right, when yeah, we do I'm apologize have a problem for on that. The eighth is my real problem on other than neighborhood, but I'll try to be here. All right, thank you. Motion passes. Thank you very much with Councillors Anderson and Nanke voting no. All right, there is no further business to come before us. We are adjourned.